Wordsworth's story birth back to the authors upon the expiry of the 25 year period. In the context of film and TV series, which typically comprise of various copyright works, the reversion of copyright means that the film or TV series as a whole will be rendered commercially inert. The same point is of application to other forms of content such as music. We therefore recommend that the compulsory reversion rights be removed. Before we actually dive into the concerns that we have that we've already highlighted and where we analyze their impact on the um, creative sector, we wanted to actually take you through the production process. But at this stage, I do want to emphasize that in doing this illustratively, we, we focused on films and on television series and the production of films and television series. But I think as we've heard here today, in respect to the other submissions that have been made, that these provisions in, in the Copyright Amendment Bill and in the Performance Protection Amendment Bill will impact the creative sector in South Africa widely. It will impact musical, the music, music sector, it will impact the publishing sector, as well as the game sector, where there are a lot of creatives involved in the development of games. So all of these sectors will be impacted, although we will be looking at this from the lens of, of the production of a film or television series, just purely for illustrative purposes um, and to highlight the difficulties that we have with, with, with the provisions that we've already laid out here today. So just to take you quickly through what it entails to-, to just, just, be, just before the production process, the inputs that were made, uh, very, I think in terms of what we have, uh, if, if we will appreciate if you can give us just that narrative, because now what we have uh, for the first presenter is bullet points and uh, the more he elab she elaborated, uh, it, it gave uh, a meaning or it added meat to the, to the skeleton. We will appreciate if you can just get that uh, for it to our team. Thank you. <laughs> okay, certainly. So we'll we'll go quickly through this and then we'll link it to the sections if, if, if that will be of assistance. So it really is the first the first element is that investment is required for production, then the second phase of pre-production, and then there's actually the production work itself, that is the creation of the film or the television series, and then there's post-production where the created um, produced film or television series is edited. Um, and made ready for distribution. The final phase is distribution, and that is making the final film or television series available to the public. Um, and this is where the actual commercialization occurs in respect to the whole production process. We also want to just emphasize that the uh, costs of production are extremely expensive. They're are a whole lot of costs associated with the production. And in order to produce any film or television series, what is required upfront before we can even commence the production process is funding. And there are many different models and commercial models for funding. So the uh, productions can be fully funded. They can be funded by means of pre-sales. Um, they can be a co-investment funding. And that's where a whole group of producers um, or investors get together and they contribute their resources and each put in a share to creating a formal television series. Um, there's also advertising funded productions and that's through the sale of on-screen and off-screen rights, as well as product placements. Um, what, what is critical here is that there is flexibility in being able to select the, the required model. Just to give you a snapshot of the production costs that are involved in making a film and television series, that it, 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 it involves an incredible number of different forms of costs. The first is the cost of obviously securing screenwriters, um, actors, um, and, and all the performers in a particular production. Then in addition to that, there's the, the, the other costs around set design, equipment, um, makeup and wardrobe, as well as pre-production uh, pre costs, as well as finding a suitable location to shoot your projects. Um, there's also on-set assistance, there's sound engine making this um, happen. 
And that these entail like subtitling, translation, and dubbing costs, it's also the cost of censorship and ratings requirements, the cost of advertising and promotion. And if the distribution costs, there's also sometimes with, with materials have to be imported into different territories, there's customs duties. There's also the manufacturing of promotional materials. Um, there's also checking the cost of box office results. Um, and distribution platform costs, as well as insurance costs. And on top of that, there are also legal fees. I mean, the legal fees run throughout the entire production process. It would be from the time that you start contracting um, with authors and performers. It will be checking to ensure that the, the final product doesn't infringe any form of copyright. It will be it's securing all the clearances and um, ensuring that every single um, aspect of the production is legal and non-infringing. So those, the, these are the costs that, that, that are going to be incurred with production. Now, one of the very important things that we've said right up front is that funding is essential. Um, so all productions require funding um, before they can commence. Without funding, there can be no film or television series. And then due to the significant cost involved in producing a film or a television series, investors and producers will want to be secure in the knowledge that they are able to recoup their investment and will require the ability to commercialize a film or television production in order to do so. What needs to be understood here is that the producer or the investor in a film or television project bears all the risk at the outset. And it's only fair that if you bear all of that risk and you put all the money in up front, that you are also able to recoup that investment and to make a profit. Now, one of the difficulties that we have with, with the proposals in the um, Copyright Amendment Bill is that the royalty share is going to be based on gross profit. And this will severely constrain the ability of an investor to recoup the cost of the production and also to determine the commercial arrangement that would be best suited for that, product, that, that particular production. The next items that we want to deal with is really just what the impact of the concerns that we've raised are going to be. And the first item is the royalty sharing arrangement. Now, the fundamental difficulty that we have with this arrangement is that it only provides for a single form of remuneration. It only provides in this regard for a single remuneration model across all forms of copyright works, and that's the payment of royalties. Now, as we've spoken about the need to have flexibility in terms of the different commercial models for production, what is also key and related to the commercial models that are selected for the funding of a production is the ability to have flexibility in terms of the remuneration that is paid to authors and performers. And this can be in the form of a royalty. It can also be in the form of an upfront payment or a revenue share. These are all accepted forms of, of remuneration within the creative industry. And uh, content producers and distributors do require the flexibility to determine which revenue model best suits their needs. But more importantly, authors and performers require flexibility and contractual freedom to determine the remuneration model and contractual terms that best suit their personal and financial circumstances. It's important to understand that in certain instances, the payment of a royalty, and this being the only option available to um, parties in terms of the, the Copyright Amendment Bill, is not always the most appropriate mechanism, especially where the nature of the work created does not attract ongoing revenue streams or where the contribution to a particular production is minor in nature. The royalty scheme also imposes substantial risk on the author or performer. And I think it's, it's been the chosen or selected form of remuneration based on the assumption that every single film or television project is going to be a commercial success. This really is not the case. And in, there are- Recording more, in progress. There are more than a number of instances where films and television series have not been successful commercially. And in a number of instances, there are films and television series that don't even um, see the light of day. They are canceled after filming 
or they even cancel after marketing or advertising has commenced. And I can refer you to an example that happened last year, and that was in respect of the film Battle, which was cancelled. Now, where you have a scenario where only a royalty payment is, is payable, and that's enforced on everyone in the industry, anyone that had any South African actor or performer or author that had participated in that production would have not received any form of remuneration. So there are, there are also other issues to consider, and that is that often the payment of a royalty can be delayed, as it often takes time for a film or a television series to reach critical success. And then even if we assume that a film or television series is successful and results in, in gross profit, a royalty scheme is still less preferable as payment would be delayed until the expiry of a period so that a gross profit could be calculated. So due to the risks imposed on investors by the introduction of the royalty sharing provision, um, it is likely that they are going to be less likely to enter into commercial contracts with South African creators as their ability to commercialize works would be severely curtailed. Our further concern is that authors and performers will have absolutely no ability to determine what best suits their financial needs, their lifestyle requirements. And in many instances, as we've said, the royalty in and of itself could be a pretty precarious um, way of contracting. And in many instances, it might be more to a performer's or an author's benefit to accept the payment of a lump sum upfront payment. The next um, issue that we wanted to just also speak to were, was the impact of the ministerial powers to prescribe terms and conditions for contracting. And I think here yeah, it is very important that the cumulative effect of the various provisions that actually deal with contracting are looked at. And these are really the fact that there's going to only be one remuneration option available in the form of, of, of a royalty share that the royalty rates are going to be prescribed by the minister, that the payment of the royalty will be triggered on each assignment of copyright, that the royalty share agreement um, be, will be based on terms on conditions determined by the minister. And then furthermore, there's going to be absolutely no ability to contract outside of the provisions of the copyright amendment bill by virtue of the contractual override in section 39B of the copyright amendment law. So the impact of all of these factors taken together is that they will remove all contractual flexibility ordinarily available to authors and performers to determine basis for their remuneration in line with their financial circumstances and needs. It will remove the direct contractual rights from the author and performer against the content producer in having to rely on a non-existent system for the collection of royalties, to also unnecessarily restrict authors and copyright owners from effectively commercializing and monetizing their rights on optimal terms. And it will also severely limit the commercial options available to investors for the funding of productions. The, also the inclusion of the contractual override provision um, we understand that that's there to ensure that everything takes place within the context of the Copyright Amendment Bill, and it's there to shore up the protections that are already set in terms of the prescribed terms and conditions, the only option of paying a royalty. But in effect, we do see that the, the negative impact on the, on the participants in this industry and not being, having any form of freedom to contract um, it is probably not justified under the circumstances. And this is particularly so if one considers that in terms of South Africans' common law of contracts, that there are already a number of protections available. And this is as a result of our constitution and our courts having developed our contractual law in line with constitutional requirements of equity and fairness. The, law, the, the, the third requirement that we want to also raise today are the registration and reporting requirements for certain acts. So in terms of this provision in, in the Copyright Amendment Bill, producers will be required to register and report on all instances where 
um, a, a certain acts take place within terms of section six and section eight of the Copyright Act. Now, these are why this includes reproducing a film or television series, adapting a film or television series, communicating a film or television series, making that film or television series available by wire or wireless means, um, distributing an original copy of the film or television series, and the commercial rental of a television um, series or a film, just to name but a few of, of those acts that are listed in, in, in the section, the applicable sections in the Copyright Amendment Bill. What this actually means is that effectively, in respect of each film or television series, producers would have to link each of the acts in Section 8 to an author and performer and to register and report on those acts. This becomes practically impossible where a film or television series makes use of hundreds of, of, of extras, such as, for example, in the form of a crowd scene, um, as producers will have to identify each person in the crowd scene and link that person to an act contemplated in Section 8 and Section 6 of, of the Copyright Amendment Bill. The registration and reporting requirements are unduly onerous, um, and they will be administratively burdensome and impossible to actually comply with. And this is further exacerbated by the fact that non-compliance um, has the, will result in the imposition of a criminal sanction. And the, the further question that we have in this regard is the effectiveness of the reporting system itself. And in this respect, the reporting system is highly dependent on there being a global system in place for the collection of royalties. No such system exists for audiovisual works, um, and, it's there, and it's therefore going to be extremely difficult to enforce these reporting and registration requirements on a global basis, as international copyright owners are not subject to this requirement. And therefore, you know, in the context of all of the concerns raised with this particular section, we do wonder whether the actual efficacy of the, the section justifies the various intrusions that it will create in respect of stakeholders in the creative industry itself. Lastly, we want to deal with um, the reversion of assignment of rights. Um, our main concern is that these amendments will result in particularly onerous obligations being placed on copyright uh, owners. By way of example, a documentary may contain new footage from multiple sources as well as pre-existing footage and music, which itself is comprised of the composition and performances. In this context, producers and distributors will be obliged to track the term of the copyright in each piece of work, as they will be barred from using a piece of work where the term has already expired. In this instance, the expired work would have to be removed from the entire work. This is completely impractical for producers and content distributors who secure assignments of copyright from a large number of authors. The reversion of rights to individual authors and performers on the expiry of the period of 25 years will also render the copyrighted work unusable in its entirety, as all of the component parts of the copyrighted work will be owned by different authors and performers, thereby making any further licensing arrangements completely impossible. Under these circumstances, there is little or no benefit to be derived um, by, from authors and performers from the reversion of their rights in literary, musical, and sound recordings. The reversion right will also deter investment into South Africa's creative sector, as foreign investors will not be incentivized to create films and TV shows in South Africa featuring, featuring South African creatives. Um, this, is, this is because production shot in South Africa or involving South Africans will be subject to the reversion of copyright rule. And just to tie this all up, we wanted to, to actually speak to where we think the actual impact will hit. And here we have some iconic um, examples of, of South Africa's participation in the international film industry. And in this regard, the impact, if the bill goes ahead in its form as currently um, drafted, 
we can safely say that Invictus would never have been made as the script would be protected by the South African copyright regime. And by virtue of the fact that the rights in that script would revert back to the author or the, or the script writer of 25 years, it would not be a viable option for the ongoing exploitation of, of, of that particular piece of content. Uh, Charlize Theron would have never fought her big break as no producer would want to work with a South African actor where their rights to the performance once again revert to them after 25 years and distinctive stories such as Sotsi would never have been shared because no foreign investment company would have invested in it and um, it's doubtful given the costs and the extent of the production that local producers would have been able to to, to actually cover the costs that went into producing Sotsi. Now, just to um, finalize, uh, we're going to deal with our recommendations and I'm going to hand over to Fatima Ismail for that. The bill should ensure that a balance is struck between the rights of creators and copyright owners. Creators should be entitled to a fair and equitable remuneration. And at the same time, content producers should be entitled to receive a return on their investment. This will ensure that the bills do in fact realize their primary objective of protecting authors and performers. At the same time, content producers should be able to receive a return on their investment to continue to provide employment opportunities for creators in South Africa. The single remuneration requirement of a royalty payment must be brought in line with the wording in the Beijing Treaty and the Performance Protection Amendments Act. The Beijing Treaty allows for a performer to receive royalties or equitable remuneration. The, the treaty is not restrictive nor prescriptive in the manner in which royalties should be paid. The only requirement is that the royalty must be equitable. This means that an upfront lump sum payment to performers as opposed to ongoing royalties is in line with the Beijing Treaty, which South Africa is a party. There should be complete freedom to contract in line with the constitutional right to freedom of contract, trade, and occupation. The contractual override provision, as well as the prescribing of terms and conditions by the minister, is an overreach on the part of the minister, and one that is not necessary in the context of our constitution, which has developed our common law of contract to include principles of contractual equity and fairness. The contractual override, when read in conjunction with the requirement that all rights will revert to the author or performer after 25 years, removes all contractual flexibility and autonomy from the author of the, or performer. The author and performer has no option but to accept the reversion of their copyright, even if this means that, no, that they can no longer benefit the, from the ongoing exploitation of the film or TV series, and such acceptance will be to their detriment. This is certainly not an optimal policy outcome given the objectives of the goals, and it is definitely not in the in best interest of authors and performers. This outcome also demonstrates why the sanctity of contract is so important and why individuals should at all times have the freedom to determine the manner in which they choose to make their own life legally through their skills and ability. In summary, we therefore recommend that the following amendments be made. Firstly, the remuneration payable to authors and performers should be amended in the Copyright Amendment Bill to refer to a royalty or equitable remuneration. Second, an option to contract out of the provisions of the Copyright Amendment Bill and the Performance Protection Amendment Act should be included. Alternatively, the contract override provision should be removed. Third, the compulsory copyright reversion right, which will be effective after the lapse of 25 years, is to be removed. Lastly, the amendments made to the sections dealing with the Copyright Tribunal in the Copyright Amendment Bill create a framework which enables authors and performers to have payment and contractual disputes expeditiously resolved on an informal basis. There is thus no need to further prescribe contractual terms and conditions or to preclude contracting out of the Copyright Act as the proposed new framework has robust protections for, for authors and performers. We would like to thank you, Honourable Chair and Honourable Members, for the opportunity to make submissions and are happy to take any questions. Thank you, uh, Fatima and uh, Janet Mukenzi, for the uh, comprehensive presentations that you have made uh, to the Select Committee. Uh, we have had uh, 
uh, how you shared uh, your views in relation to uh, royalties regarding literary or musical work and audiovisual works as captured in section 8A and transfer of rights in terms of section 3A of the performance protection bill. Let me check uh, with the for the team whether is there any participating questions that they would want to to to, to, to raise uh, uh, in relation to the presentation? Uh, uh, it looks like none. Uh, let me just check uh, check uh, uh, ascertain something from from the team uh, in relation to. Because my understanding is that uh, your, your, your fundamental uh, challenge uh, in relation to the two goals is the contemplation of a single remuneration model across all forms of uh, copyright. That is uh, what I could deduce from you. And uh, uh, the assertion that uh, in, in, in the industry, it is common uh, cause or it's customary for a number of different commercial arrangements to be added into by corporate owners uh, with authors and performers in respect of production uh, of audiovisual work. So the question that I want to to ascertain from you is uh, from your observation uh, as that has in the industry, is there sufficient is there sufficient uh, uh, protection for uh, uh, those authors and performers in the bigger scheme of things, or the or the producers or the investors uh, have. Uh, uh, an equal bargaining power or in equilibrium uh, in, in terms of negotiating, uh, uh, but we allow the view to ensure that there is a equitable remuneration uh, across, across the entire supply chain. Uh, that's one from my side. Okay, thank you very much for, for that question. So I, th I think, you know, if we look at the industry itself, it's one where there are dependencies. So investors, you, you need, in order to do a production, they would have to fund that production, but they can't do that production without the contribution of authors and performers. And in many instances, um, a whole television series or film will be dependent on the a claim of that author or performer and under those circumstances, um, there, there would definitely be equal bargaining terms and powers on either side to, to do that. And I think that what we're looking for is to ensure that really that we have a system in place that deals with these issues on a, on a balanced basis so that the interests of both parties are secured and looked after. And all we want really is the flexibility to um, allow for different remuneration models to be negotiated, to be discussed and to be put into effect. As, as I think you pointed out in many instances, it might not be to the benefit of a performer or an author to um, actually be dependent on the royalty payment because that might never ever come. Uh, and what we want to also do is to ensure that the contractual terms and conditions um, are ones that are capable of free, free negotiation and oversight by the Copyright Tribunal. We note that the Copyright Tribunal provisions have been substantially amended and now allow for the Tribunal to have oversight in terms of the royalties that are payable, uh, the contractual terms and conditions that are entered into, and to actually adjudicate and determine those disputes. We also note that the, the, the Act itself provides for an effective process and one that's based on natural justice and one that is going to be quick 
and not take a lengthy period of time to resolve a dispute. So we do feel that in terms of the construct that is already put in place in the Copyright Amendment Bill, that there are sufficient protections, that there is access to a body that is going to be presided over by a judge to determine your dispute and to deal with any issues that might arise. And this is a far preferable scenario to actually putting in place a regime which doesn't allow any flexibility of contract, which requires only one form of remuneration, um, where the royalty rates are determined um, and where you can't actually bury your contract under any other basis. And so this is where we think the balance should be struck and is where the balance should in fact be struck in order for investment to continue, for South African performers and authors to continue to flourish and to, 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 to make their livelihoods successful and productive ones. Sorry, Chair, I think you're on mute. Oh, my apology. <laughs> my apology. I was uh, expressing a word of gratitude to, to how you uh, honored our, our invite. Uh, it's, a, it's a learning curve uh, uh, because we are able, you were able to give us a sense uh, in terms of. Uh, <clears throat> your appreciation of uh, an understanding of uh, royalties as proposed in the, in the, in, in, in the bill, uh, the, the uh, powers vested in the, in, in, in the minister, but also uh, the, 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 uh, the concern in relation to, to uh, the lack of flexibility in respect of uh, the commercial arrangement uh, uh, as contemplated by the bill, uh, the, the, the sense that, uh, that, 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 that you gave us is that there is a need to uh, uh, look at other forms of remuneration, uh, which uh, could be applicable along, along the chain. Uh, as we continue to engage uh, with the uh, members of the public, uh, at the back of our mind will be yeah, the lessons learned from this presentation. And again, on behalf of the Select Committee yeah, of Trade and Industry, uh, my sincere gratitude to the law firm Baker McKenzie, led by Janet McKenzie and uh, uh, Fatima Ismail. Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, thank you very much, Chip. Thank you. Uh, honorable members, uh, that was. Uh, uh, the firm, the firm uh, Baker McKenzie, uh, in terms of uh, their uh, presentation. Uh, the next presenter and presentation will be from Ms. Dennis Nicholson. Uh, Ms. Dennis. Um, good afternoon, Chair. Unfortunately, I'm not able to share my screen. It says I'm, um, it's been turned off. Uh, can someone help me share my screen? Sure. That's okay. Nice. Enrico, can you help uh, Ms. Nicholson? Okay, I think my team will, will, will come to your rescue. Madia? Yeah. It says it's been decided. <laughs> She just, um, <clears throat> just for clarity, does she need hosting rights or does she need us to um, project the presentation on her behalf? No, I need, I need hosting so I can click them forward. I okay. Need to look, uh, yeah, thanks. <clears throat> okay, will definitely, nice. okay, there you are. Thanks very much. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and good afternoon, Chairperson and Select Committee members. I hope you can hear me. We can. Can you hear me? Yeah. 
Yeah. Thank you for this opportunity to present today. I am Denise Nicholson from Scholarly Horizons. I'm a specialist copyright librarian with 26 years experience in the copyright and scholarly publishing fields, 24 years of which were at Wits University. Um, the educational and library sectors have been calling for amendments to the bill since 1998, which is 25 years. I want to thank the DTIC, Parliament, and its legal team for their efforts to draft and revise the bill several times with many public submissions and oral hearings to address the needs of stakeholders. The Copyright Amendment Bill, or the CAB, is an extremely complex but progressive bill that will quantum leap South Africa's copyright law into the 21st century and the fourth industrial revolution. My presentation will highlight issues of concern with current copyright claims and will show how the CAB will remedy omissions, restrictions, and unconstitutionality in the copyright. For too long, international copyright trends have been to shrink the, copyright, the public domain and restrict access to knowledge, to strengthen protection and erode information users' rights, to take and control the copyright from authors and creators, to co commodify knowledge and double dip to increase revenue streams, to monopolize royalties and privatize profits, to fail to remunerate rightful authors and creators, to create knowledge and digital gaps and to override exceptions in uh, contracts. Whether you like it or not, the world copyright system is flawed. The digital world has disrupted copyright and now AI is doing that right now. But the wheels of change turn very slowly. In the digital space, creators are users and users are creators. Publishers are users and users are publishers. Library and information entities and research and educational institutions are custodians, users, creators, inventors, AI experts, programmers, authors and publishers, editors and reviewers, teachers and learners, and many more. They all need to use and reuse information daily. Without the print and online resources managed and made as accessible by libraries and archives, authors and creators would not be able to innovate and create new works. Everyone who makes culture or participates in the innovation eco economy relies on fair use routinely, whether they recognize it or not. Creator and user activities have become intertwined in the digital space. For example, I'm a specialist librarian with an LLM degree in copyright. I'm also an educator, author, blogger, amateur artist and photographer, a researcher, contributor to policy documents, an occasional editor, a web publisher, an entrepreneur, an active citizen, a lifelong learner, and a home executive. To function in any of these roles, I have to use, write, share, create, and publish information on a regular basis. So where is the line between user, creator, and publisher? Now think about your own roles. On a daily basis, consider all the works you use, reuse, remix, transform, adapt, translate, format shift, copy, take photographs of, or compile for teaching and learning, including presentations, publications, or share with colleagues or others via email, WhatsApp, or social media, or broadcast, record, or invent, innovate, or create new works. Are you a creator, user, or publisher, or all three? Do you apply for permission for everything you need to use? The way technology is advancing, it is impossible to apply for permission and pay fees and then wait for clearance every time you need to use others' works. <clears throat> the digital world could not function if that was the case. Trevor Noah, for instance, would never have been able to do the daily show in South Africa. In the US, fair use enabled him to use all sorts of um, works, including images, news clips, quotes, recordings, etc., without clearance. So let's look at the hierarchy of knowledge and see why a balanced copyright law is crucial. Knowledge is analogous to a coral reef system with each coral attaching itself to another and developing into something bigger and different, yet maintaining parts of its original makeup. Knowledge grows by the inclusion of many sources and the creation of something new and different, yet still maintaining common extracts from previous works, either from the public domain or from copyright works. Authors and creators themselves need a rich and vibrant public domain and other resources to inspire innovation and create new works. In essence, no work is totally original. It's about standing on the shoulders of giants. Research and scholarship rely on the public domain as a, public, as a building block to the creation of new knowledge. Education is promoted through the spread of ideas and information, and access to cultural heritage is enabled through symphonies, ancient texts, amongst others. 
Copyright law gives authors and creators a statutory monopoly over their works for a very long time, regardless of whether they include public domain, open content, or copyright works. They include extracts, quotations, images, clips, recordings, etc., from your works and others' works. Then claim copyright on all the content included in their new works. Most authors or creators then assign their copyright to publishers, who then take ownership and control of the copyright for its full term. When the authors or creators want to do a new edition, translation, or anything else, they have to get permission from the publishers for their own work. When someone else wants to use those works, permission and payment of a fee is necessary. Since the publishers are the main controllers, owners, and beneficiaries of copyright, how exactly is copyright benefiting authors and creators? Were rights holders to have total control over works, knowledge would be completely locked up and totally inaccessible to others, making the goals of copyright intangible. That is why balancing mechanisms called limitations and exceptions are sanctioned in international IP treaties. They are fundamental for access to knowledge and thus for human and social development. The WIPO Copyright Treaty's preamble emphasizes the need to maintain a balance between the rights of authors and the larger public interest, particularly education, research, and access to information. To date, South Africa has failed to adopt appropriate limitations and exceptions. Incidentally, Chief Justice McLaughlin, in a landmark case, CCH Canadian versus Law Society of Upper Canada, stressed that exceptions are more than mere defenses, they are users' rights. Last September, the Constitutional Court declared the Copyright Act unconstitutional as it relates to visually impaired people. The act seriously conflicts with our Bill of Rights and International Human Rights Conventions. It is arguably an unconstitutional for other reasons too, and here are just some examples. It omits exceptions for and discriminates against legal deposit libraries, museums and galleries, which are custodians of our cultural heritage. It's print-based and it predates the birth of internet by five years. It is inflexible and restrictive regarding education, academic activities, research, libraries and archives and of course, digitization and curation, and prevent sharing and most digital activities, including text and data mining and temporary, temporary digital copies. It is not future-proof for ever-changing uh, technologies, so it stymies access to information, research, innovation, and creativity. It prohibits translations into other languages for educational or other purposes. It fails to address orphan works properly, I mean, sorry, at all, many of which form part of our cultural heritage, but are inaccessible because rights owners are untraceable. It prohibits parallel importation and fair competition. One of the reasons South Africa has such high prices is that the publishers focus on only about 10% of the market who can afford books to make their profits. And secondly, in recent years, the Competition Commission has done an investigation into the South African publishing industry for alleged price fixing of textbooks and other works for decades. The report has not yet been made public though. This prevents fair competition and harms everyone in the knowledge chain. And I've given a link on my slide. It minimizes the control that authors and creators have over their works. It fails to protect them from exclusive licenses and permanent assignments, biased contracts and unfair royalty payments. It doesn't allow royalties for artists or performers or resale rights for artistic works. The act fails to hold collecting societies or CMOs accountable. They are not transparent and do not pay fee royalties. It is not surprising then that the CMOs and the creative industries are the strongest opponents of the book. It is no secret that book prices in journal and e-subscriptions are exorbitant in South Africa and are often cheaper abroad. South African institutions provide the salaries and resources, content, authors, editors and reviewers for publishers globally, who then take copyright ownership, repackage the content and sell it back to South African institutions and libraries at inflated prices. Then when material is published open access, they demand excessive article processing charges from authors. Then when others want to copy extracts from the works, they have to pay high copyright fees, sometimes over and over again, depending on how often they use the material. If they want to use an article from an already paid for digital work on a secure e-learning platform for registered students during the course, they have to pay for so-called transient copies. This is double dipping or triple dipping at its best. This must be the most absurd business model around. A 2018 survey showed that 15 out of 26 public universities in South Africa paid over a billion rand for books and e-resources that year. The amount increases annually with inflation, exchange rates, and import levies. The remaining institutions couldn't provide figures as they were bound by non-disclosure clauses in their contracts. In addition, 14 of the 15 public institutions paid over 31 million that year copyright licenses to the CMO Delro for material included in printed course packs or placed on e-learning platforms. This amount increases annually. 
Institutions pay millions of rands every year for licenses, yet the number of photocopies has reduced considerably and will continue to reduce due to more digital and open access resources being used. Many publishers allow course packs too. Delroy has created a steady income stream by focusing on the public universities with an admin fee of up to 13%. Few of any businesses or private institutions have a license with Delroy, nor do schools. Their mandates are limited to extracts of works and do not include digital works, so institutions have to clear them separately and pay rights holders additional fees. More than 65% of fees collected flows out to the international publishers, many of whom pay little or nothing to authors. Most scholarly authors I've asked I've said, have said they have never received money for use of their journal articles and little or nothing for their book chapters. One top academic and later a member of parliament never received a cent for use of her books for years. When a statement was requested, it was found that the publisher had received money from Dalro, but the publisher had not shared them with the academic. Unfortunately, she couldn't claim anything at the stage as the publisher had been taken over by a multinational. Publishers also control what content can be used or digitized, what articles can go on institutional repositories, who can publish and where material can be published, who can buy ebooks, etc. This is a global problem. In the COVID lockdown, publishers refused to sell ebooks to libraries and expected students to purchase them despite their high prices and restrictive licenses. The question must be asked if our copyright law is supposed to protect our authors and creators, then why are multinationals the main beneficiaries of our copyright? So how can this situation change for South Africa? The cap must be passed as soon as possible for the benefit of our country and in line with our constitution. The DTR prudently examined, then adopted or adapted appropriate and progressive laws and copyright exceptions from many countries, including the US, UK, EU, Singapore, Germany, and others, as well as WIPO treaties and proposals for treaties by the Africa Group and IFRA and the Eiffel Model Copyright Law. It also commissioned research studies and the Copyright Commission Review, and was guided by international and regional research as well as the SA Open Copyright Review. Obviously, the Bill of Rights, the NDP and SDGs were key issues, as was the 2015 Cape Town Declaration when South Africa and 13 other African countries committed to encourage the implementation of fair and balanced copyright laws to facilitate access to information for all. For many years, South Africa strongly supported the Africa Group's proposals at WITS, uh, sorry, at WIPO, for a treaty for libraries, archives, education, and research. Yet its national law does not reflect this. This is a contradiction in terms which the CAB will rectify. South Africa is a global player and is committed to international agreements and national treatment. Instead of reinventing the wheel, it is commended for being proactive and for tapping into this rich trove of useful resources, all drafted by copyright and other experts around the world. All countries take appropriate clauses from treaty documents and other copyright regimes and tailor them to their domestic needs. That is how national copyright laws are drafted. Um, based on the broad framework used and expert opinions on the matter, see the links on the screen, the CAB is indeed compliant with inter international commitments. In the, in the review process, no evidence was submitted to the contrary. No WIPO or WTO dispute mechanisms have ever been activated against any country with similar provisions to those in the bill. Apart from the US, my slide lists other countries that have adopted fair use or call it fair dealing but adapt the fair use factors. So hybrid models are not unusual. Fair use provisions in the CAB are not broader than other fair use countries. They do, however, provide more detail and examples which give more clarity to users. Whatever is permitted under Section 12A would also be permitted in the US and other countries that include the words such as or including in their fair use clauses. Many organizations and countries, including in Africa, have been following the CAB with keen interest. Kenya quietly shifted from fair dealing to fair use, and Canada has expanded its fair dealing. In its recently passed bill, Nigeria calls it fair dealing, but uses such as and adopts the four fair use factors. And on the screen, I've given you links to recommendations for fair use by Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. Fair dealing is limited, inflexible, and doesn't address the ever-changing digital environment. So is fair use an enabler or a negative disruptor? A key finding in the African Copyright and Access to Knowledge a research project in 2007 to 2010, conducted in eight African countries, including South Africa, found that the stricter the copyright law, the higher level of infringement. It was infringing acts that enabled access to information, not the copyright laws in place. Better compliance comes with fair and balanced copyright laws. 
This is obviously evident in the digital space. Just look at social media, conferences, and even parliamentary hearings and see how fair use is already being used, even though it is infringing our current copyright law. As of January 2023, there were 5.6 billion internet users worldwide, of which 4.76 billion were social media users. In a digital world, it is impossible to function under a print-based 1978 copyright law with restricted fair dealing. Hopefully fair use and other exceptions will le legitimize some of the digital sharing that happens daily. Nowhere in the world is there empirical evidence that shows that fair use destroys creative industries. Despite doomsday warnings of a catastrophic nature, publishers, authors, and creators continue to prosper in countries with fair use. So why shouldn't they prosper in South Africa? In fact, fair use contributes mil millions of jobs and trillions of dollars to the US economy each year. And there's a report on the screen. Fair use is not carte blanche for piracy. Not all copying is fair use. Fair use with its four determining factors is an enabler in the digital space, and it is flexible and future-proof. It will address ever-changing technologies, enable transformative uses, text and data mining, new innovations, 3D creations, gaming, AI, etc. And also see a link for many best practices or guidelines on fair use for different stakeholders. The speed at which technology is evolving makes fair use the inevitable choice for the future. The future is now, and SA must embrace it now. Myths about fair use abound. Absurdly, supporters of fair use and the balanced bill have been called big tech agents, copyright antagonists, and the dark forces. This is indeed science fiction at its best. One myth that is constantly repeated by opponents of the bill is that fair use will allow an institution to copy a whole textbook and then make 2,000 copies and give copies to each student so this will avoid them having to buy the book. Perhaps they don't know, but this would be serious infringement, not fair use at all. To big tech, fair use may be a bonus in South Africa, but it doesn't matter because they already benefit from fair use and use South African works lawfully under fair use. But we can't do the same with their works as fair dealing is so restrictive. I've given you slides on many resources that will debunk many myths about fair use. On returning the bill to Parliament for review in 2020, the President gave no valid reasons why certain sections of the bill might not be constitutional. Why? Because they were and still are constitutional and were approved again with few amendments by the National Assembly last year. Seemingly, our president's referral back to parliament was a knee-jerk response to the shocking economic bullying by the US and EU, orchestrated by multinationals and US entertainment industries, which, by the way, benefit from fair use daily. See links on slide relating to the undue interference in our domestic copyright reforms. What if the US and EU don't like the final version of this cab again? Are they going to have another major tantrum and upset the apple cart again? No, this must never be allowed to happen again. There's been much support for the bill from international, regional, and local institutions, organizations, NGOs, trade unions, etc. I support the bill, and especially Section 12A, Fair Use, and the following sections. Section 12B to D, exceptions for education and academic activities, will help to transform research, teaching, and learning programs, especially in the digital environment. The exception for course backs is welcomed. India and Canada also enjoy similar exceptions. Section 15.1 allows freedom of panorama, so photos can be taken of public but copyrighted statues and monuments, etc. Section 19b allows digital temporary copies. Section 19c has very helpful exceptions for libraries, archives, museums, and galleries, which will help all stakeholders and help preserve our cultural heritage. Also allows authors to share their manuscript works in open access institutional repositories if their research was funded 50% or more from public funds. Section 19D will stop discrimination against people with disabilities. It will need to be amended though in accordance with the recent blind SA constitutional court ruling. It also extends to other disabilities, including deafness, deaf blindness, dyslexia, et cetera. With sign language soon becoming an official language, this will be very helpful to the deaf community. Section 28P should also be deleted in line with the concrete ruling. Section 22A is totally impractical, costly, and cumbersome, and will take months before an orphan work can be used. The setting up of a fund just in case an untra tra untraceable rights holder might somehow find out that his anonymous or abandoned work has been used, and miraculously where to claim it from is a pipe dream. The fund will have to be managed and audited, yet there may not be any claims. So what will happen to this pot of money? That will grow. 
I recommend that this section be rewritten, permitting the use of orphan works for at least educational research and non-commercial purposes. Fair use would also apply in many instances. Sections 12D, 7E and 39B should be welcomed by individuals and institutions that often get the raw end of a contract. The bill ensures that contracts will not override lawful exceptions in the future. This was adopted from the Eiffel model copyright law and is in the Singapore copyright law and the EU's unfair contract terms directive. It is not to restrict freedom um, to contract, but to ensure fairness to all parties. Authors and creators will benefit from above exceptions too. The bill will also give them more control over their works, better moral rights and contractual protection, resale rights of artistic works and fairer royalties. Regulation of collecting societies or CMOs will finally ensure transparency and accountability and fair practice. So creators will receive fair royalties in future. Check Google, just do a Google search um, and see how many scandals there are about CMOs in the music industry. The establishment of the tribunal is welcomed. And, um, sorry, uh, Sorry, the um, delays in the copyright bill are also holding up amendments of laws in the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture relating to culture and libraries and finalization of the national digitization policy and the open data and cloud policy. They cannot be finalized until the bill is passed. Sorry. Um, Suggestions that the bill should go back to the drawing board are counterproductive. Many countries abroad have enjoyed similar exceptions for decades, so why should SA not benefit too? Opponents of the bill ignore the huge investment made in time, effort, human and other resources, public inputs and hearings, revisions, the review, et cetera, to get the bill to this stage. No law is perfect, nor does every law suit everyone. It would be a serious failure though of parliament if this bill doesn't succeed after six years in the making and 14 years since its genesis. It is therefore imperative that solutions be found in this current process so that the bill be pro, um, they can proceed for assent to the Pope President. In his Heritage Day speech last year, the President stated, the new copyright amendment bill passed by the National Assembly at the beginning of this Heritage Month will go a long way in protecting our artists and towards addressing their concerns about the collection and distribution of royalties. We are determined to use the law where necessary to preserve our cultural heritage. Currently, performers and actors are treated as independent contractors, as you heard in previous um, presentations, and cannot earn royalties. They have no protection under the Copyright Act, Labor Act, or any other related legislation. As a result, they have no benefits or rights, including medical insurance, UIF, workman's compensation, etc. The Performance Protection Bill and the Copyright Amendment Bill are interdependent and cannot be split into two separate bills. Both bills enable performers and actors to earn royalties for the first time ever. Regulations can clarify who and who does not qualify for royalties, for example, extras, as dealt with in the Beijing Treaty. Yes, South Africa is a favorite place for international filmmakers. It is also a cheap place where South African actors and performers are exploited. Yes, some of our very talented and internationally recognized actors and performers are fortunate to be included, but they receive a once-off payment for their contribution. They do not earn any royalties, whilst international stars like Denzel Washington, Tom Cruise, Clint Eastwood and others continue earning handsome royalties as long as that work is shown. The bill will hopefully stop this unfair practice and provide a more equitable remuneration system for actors and performers. Parliament is urged to pass both laws as soon as possible. In conclusion, the history of South Africa makes it a national imperative to build an informed nation, remove apartheid era legislation and inequalities, create self-reliance amongst individuals through access to information and technologies, as well as to build and sustain vibrant communities. The bill is long overdue. To avoid more delays, many issues can be, still be improved in this process or addressed or clarified in regulations. Further delays in the bill will have a costly impact on the economy, creativity and innovation, education and research, and libraries and other information entities by reducing the ability of citizens to have access to information, knowledge and research in a digital environment. Please act urgently to pass the CAP, or else it will create an incongruent situation where South Africa's own copyright laws cannot do domestically what it is asking for at the international level at WIFO and WTO. I'm just sharing some links um, about the bill and the reform process um, and um, some common questions about the CAP, et cetera. 
and thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Tunis, uh, from uh, Scholarly Horizon for that comprehensive presentation. Dean uh, and I opener. Let me just ascertain uh, from the from the members whether is there any uh, clarity seeking questions that you would want to raise. Uh, I suspect, I suspect you were more, you were more detailed uh, in terms of uh, uh, where you come from. Uh, but more than that, also the, I think uh, for the benefit of the select committee, uh, numerous and various links that you have shared with us so that uh, our research team uh, can also do a lot of uh, the consultation. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Dennis. Uh, you were quite, you were, you were, you were, you were, you were quite uh, uh, categorical in terms of uh, the agency for the bill to be to be passed. That's that, that's what that's what you said, and you articulated reasons as to why uh, your, your support. But I think more than that, uh, drawing uh, drawing a parallel between uh, various countries in terms of uh, how they understand and also uh, 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 apply uh, and draw a distinction between fair use and fair dealings. I think it was one of the issues that I want to sense from you. There's, there's a, a matter around a compare comparison between between countries that you have shared history with and countries that you have not shared history with. It will be obviously the, the developing world and the developed world, uh, the North and the South. Uh, uh, but I think what's quite critical is uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, 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 it's uh, the transformative uh, angle from which uh, your presentation comes from. I think that's the sense that I could get because the, 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 the the emphasis on the on the on the producers, uh, the uh, the broadcasters, the publishers, uh, vis a vis uh, the authors, vis a vis various actors in the supply chain. Is it broad enough, or there is a need? Uh, there is a need to to do more work. Uh, Precisely by virtue of where we come from, is the copyright is the current copyright more transformative enough? Uh, uh, what are the gaps that uh, that that that, that, that uh, has led to the to 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 the review, particularly given the 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 history where we come from, the artists and performers meeting with uh, with with the uh, DTIC meeting with the. Uh, uh, I mean, which led to the review uh, commission in terms of uh, uh, how how our copyright has or intellectual property regime has evolved. Over to mm. you. Mm -hmm. Over to you, Nicholson. Um, yes, um, I think you've encapsulated everything that I said in a, a nice uh, way. Um, I think yes, it's uh, uh, you know been involved in this um, right from 1998. Um, We've been campaigning and calling for um, you know improvement of the bill, and I think it's time. You know how long must we wait um, to get to it all the time? Most of these exceptions, if not all of them, come from other uh, other countries. Um, they're enjoying it, especially developed countries are developing, you know, enjoying them all the time. Um, people in the US enjoy it every day, but they don't want developing countries to have it. Why not? And what is their reason for holding back? Um, there's obviously profit margins or something that uh, is stopping them wanting um, others to benefit from what they already benefit from. I think it's it's extremely urgent. I can't say it's you know it's more than urgent that these rules be passed. Um, as I say, regulations can deal with quite a lot of the issues uh, where you actually spe specify or clarify certain issues, um, and that process will also take a time. But to think of going back to the drawing board is totally ridiculous um, and frivolous, to be honest. Because um, you know where they're going to start and who's going to get together to do this, 
um, where the documents already include you know, clauses that from all over the world, which are written by co uh, copyright experts anyway. Uh, and it's going to take another 10 years. And by then, the whole technology and AI and everything will have taken over and we'll have, be looking at something totally new. Um, so we've got to you know, deal with the situation now. If things change, yes, we'll change the, and hopefully we can change the copyright law more often than we have when things do change. But with fair use, fortunately, you don't have to change a lot about technology because America has had fair use since 1976, although they've used it for the past 200 years, and so it's the UK in parts, um, and they never have had to change their law because fair use is outdated, whereas fair dealing is totally outdated. But, and fair use is generally more personal. It's got nothing to do with sharing or putting on the web. Um, you know, it's very limited. And so I do hope that... Um, reason will prevail and that uh, we'll move forward with this ball. And thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, Denise uh, uh, Nicholson for honoring our appointment. Uh, indeed, on behalf of the committee, a word of sincere gratitude, gratitude to you and your team. Uh, uh, we are quite uh, happy about uh, how you responded to our, our, our clarion call to the public to make inputs. And uh, therefore, it will assist us in terms of uh, the work that we do in terms of deliberating and coming to a particular conclusion. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, honorable members, we will now move to our next uh, presenter, uh, which will be Professor Thomas Pinsky. Uh, Bob? I'm here, yes. Uh, can folks hear me? Oh, brilliant, 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 brilliant. The floor, the floor is yours. Yes, and then I'll need permission to share my screen. All right. Maria, can you help the prof? Um, uh, uh, Professor's already been given hosting rights to Okay, great. Prof, oh. the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Let me just bring my slides up. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you to the chair and the select committee members for allowing me to talk to you today, uh, make several points. Uh, and I know you're running short on time, so um, I will be uh, as brief as possible. Uh, a little bit of background about myself. Uh, you uh, might think uh, or wonder why uh, a person from the United States wants to come and talk to South Africa, but Actually, my connections to South Africa go back 20 or 30 years. I uh, lectured in summers at the University of Pretoria. I still continue to speak and consult in South Africa annually. And in fact, spoke at the University of Cape Town as recently as uh, December on uh, fair use. So I've been a lawyer and an educator for several decades, uh, speaking and teaching and publishing on the topic of fair use. And um, I've been an uh, expert legal advisor to copyright and other legal matters uh, of IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. And I chair the American Library Association Committee on Legislation Subcommittee CLEAN, the Copyright Legislation Education Advisory Network. So when I look at the SAB or CAB, uh, I speak today in favor of the exceptions and limitations that are in the bill. It's a very forward thinking um, and progressive piece of legislation. And uh, it, I think, reflects a modern view of copyright law, uh, which is really a balance of rights between copyright or rights holders and users. And that is an evolving, I think, in the literature expression of copyright, uh, but it's a modern one. And our courts have had an opportunity to discuss the purposes of copyright. And uh, it's really not about rewarding publishers, rewarding authors. Yes, that happens. But the ultimate goal is really to benefit the public good by creating more works that at some point will either fall into the public domain because the copyright has expired or because there is a robust set of exceptions and limitations. 
There is a uh, report that's done every year by the World Intellectual Property Organization. It's called the Global Innovation Index. The most recent one came out last fall. And you see the flags of the top 10 countries of the world, it's no surprise. Three of those countries have fair use and several others are moving towards a fair dealing type of exceptions limitations that more parallel fair use. South Africa incidentally ranked 61st out of 132 countries and it's second in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Mauritius being the first. The Global Innovation Index is based on a series of inputs and outputs. And in South Africa over the last three years, while the inputs have been going up, the indicators of outputs have been going down. And the countries that share have a robust set of exceptions and limitations in their copyright law. Some examples within the copyright law, as our previous speaker noted, are contractual override positions uh, that are limited perhaps to public institutions and knowledge organizations, technological protection measures that prevent those measures from taking away use rights and fair use. I wanna talk a little bit about fair use and explain to you how we apply it in the United States. There is, I think, a myth that once you have fair use, everything is game. That's not true. Even if you look at the phrasing of our statute and your proposed bill, the such as and including language only lists possible fair uses. This still must be an analysis of four fair use factors or however many fair use factors you wanna develop. Everything is not fair use. Our courts ask the purpose and the character of the use, whether it's commercial or non-commercial. And incidentally, courts here in the States have said that simply because you don't charge for it, that doesn't mean it's non-commercial. The definition of non-commercial from our Supreme Court is failing to pay the customary price. So in the example of our previous speaker, I talked about the textbook reproduction for thousands of students, that would be failing to pay the customary price and the purpose would be deemed commercial. The second question that our courts look at within the first factor is whether the use substitutes for the original or whether it's transformative. And again, in the example provided by the previous speaker, handing out or making available those thousands of textbooks would be a substitute, a superseding use without any transformative nature whatsoever. So our courts look very closely at whether the use is different than what the intended purpose was. Is it transformative? And I will give you examples of that transformative use in my examples. There's a shifting of evident free burden so that if the first factor favors fair use, then it is up to the rice holder to demonstrate a market, market harm. However, if the first factor weighs against fair use, then the defendant must show that there is no harm to the market. The second factor is the nature of the work. And here our courts look at whether the work is thick copyright, that is goes to the creative core of the purpose of copyright. Or is it thin copyright, mainly factual? There's more fair use in a thin work than in a thick work. And then secondly, is the work published or unpublished? We've had several cases over the years involving unpublished letters. The third factor is the substantiality portion taken the amount. Some people call this the how much test, but it really is more subtle than that. It involves a quantitative assessment and also a qualitative one. Yes, some courts still add numbers and talk about percents, 
but it may be that a very small taking is still harmful because it's a qualitative taking of so-called the heart of the work. Also, courts today ask a third question, which is, are you taking only as much as is necessary to accomplish a good transformative purpose? And you'll see in my examples that that, in fact, has occurred in several cases. Then finally, the fourth factor, the market factor, which our courts have said is the most important factor. Copyright is, after all, a property right, it's an economic right. And so we're concerned about preserving the market. What is the natural market of a copyright holder? So we look at the primary market, the original purchase price, secondary markets that might be licensing markets, permissions markets, reprints, and of course, the derivative right. Turning a book into a movie, turning a story into a play. Those are likely and obvious additional markets that a copyright or rights holder may want to enter. But our courts have said not transformative markets, not fair use markets. And I'll give you examples of some of those in my cases that I would like to explain to you. Courts consider all four factors regardless. So even though it may be a transformative use such as a criticism, a book review, if the book review gave away the surprise ending or said which lead character dies in this volume, those likely would not be transformative markets. Again, even though criticism, commentary can all be fair use, such as all four factors must be considered. So I want to present six cases to you four from the book publishing industry, two of which were fair use, two of which were not, and then two cases of the evolving information tech sector involving Google. So this is the first case, and <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about the facts of these cases because they're so visual. So we had several posters advertising and promoting uh, a rock group from the 1960s. You may know the name, The Grateful Dead. And then there was a publisher that wanted to create, market, sell a book about the band. And it was subtitled An Illustrated Trip. So you can see from the sample pages that it was very visual. Lots of pictures, copies of tickets, of course, tie-dye shirts, if you know anything about the Grateful Dead in the 60s era, and several examples, several posters were included in this timeline. The court, when assessed, facing a fair use assessment, looked at the first factor and said, well, what is the nature it's not to promote the concert anymore. This book was written years and years after. And arguably, because the images are so small on the page, it really doesn't function as a work of pop art anymore. Rather, it's used as a historical marker to indicate the band's development over time and how the posters and the advertisements that they use change over time. Second factor, obviously very creative. Third factor, they took the entire poster, albeit shrunk down to fit on the page, but trying to take of a visual work of art, some magic number, 5%, 10%, doesn't really work. And so the court said, well, you took 100%, but that's what was necessary to accomplish the good purpose. Finally, the fourth factor, because you are in a transformative market, a fair use market, that is not an expected market of the rights holder, at least the way our courts, courts have interpreted it. The same way that book reviews, criticisms, other works of function, 
So this was ultimately a fair use. This is another example of fair use. Obviously the iconic, how the Grinch stole Christmas. Somebody made a parody of it. One act off Broadway play. But gone was the world of holding hands and singing songs and making everything better. It was a body, adult oriented, blue humor parody of the original feel good Dr. Seuss story. And the court said that is a transformative purpose parody. So the first factor weighs in favor of good and fair use. It's a commercial use. This person wants to sell tickets, wants to get you to come to the show. And actually most of our fair use cases are commercial use cases. But the question is whether it's transformative or not, whether it serves a different purpose or not. Her story did not retell the feel good story of the original Dr. Seuss story. Yes, it's very creative under the second factor. She took enough elements of the story in the how much test, the third factor, to get the joke, as courts have said. You need to allow the parodist to take enough from the original so people understand what's being made fun of. And then, most importantly, the fourth factor, there is no substitute effect here. If you really want another version of or interpretation of the original feel-good story by Dr. Seuss, maybe you'll get the cartoon version from the 60s narrated by Boris Karloff. Maybe you'll watch the movie with Jim Carrey. But you're not going to go to see this play in order to have that original experience. This is an off-color parody intended for adult audiences. There's no possibility that consumers will go see that play in lieu of reading The Grinch or some other authorized derivative work. So these two cases are samples of fair use, but everything is not fair use. Here's two other book publishing cases. The iconic Catcher in the Rye. Salinger was asked many times to write a sequel. He never did. Another author came along, wrote a sequel, and wanted a publisher wanted to publish that book. So again, commercial uses. But when the court looked at the four factors, the first factor, there was not really much transformation here. I mean, other than taking some of the key elements from the Catcher in the Rye story, and then having the characters age really isn't very transformative. And so the first factor did not favor fair use. They tried to make a parody argument, and that was rejected by the court as well, as you can see this snippet from the opinion. The second nature, creative core of copyright. Third, again, take no much, so much more, no more, no more than is necessary to serve the alleged critical purpose, but heavily against the finding of fairies because they basically said, well, we're, we're having all the characters transplanted. They're just going to be 60 years old. And this is a sequel, obviously. That's an expected market for a copyright holder. Sequels, prequels, crossovers. Those are all expected markets. And so it was quite easy for this court to conclude this is not fair use. It's another example, a whole series of very famous books from the 20th century and stories. And again, another publisher has the idea, let's make these books accessible for a younger audience. Basically retelling the story, shortened it, Words are smaller, so children can understand it. And then they added two pages of sort of notes and criticisms. And when it came to the first factor, the court said, well, okay, you've added a couple of things, a few pages, but that's really not transforming. It's not really meaningfully recasting the work. It's just retelling the story for a younger audience. And again, these are creative works of fiction, goes to the core of copyright. 
And again, you're basically under the how much test of the third factor, you're telling the stories. Two pages of analysis is not going to make the difference. The fourth factor, again, the burden shifts and the defendants can't show that their works will not adversely affect the market either for the originals or for derivative works. And both sides agreed that there's an established market for children's versions of adult novels. So again, this is another case where it was quite easy for the court to say, no, that's not a fair use. Everything isn't always a fair use. And then we have two cases involving Google. And this is Google Books. I'm sure many of you have used the service. Well, Google was sued. Why? Because they're scanning entire books to go into their database. And so you and I can find the little snippets of pieces that an index, an official index or a table of content, contents doesn't capture. Okay, so this is another tool of function. And the court felt that that was a transformative use. Or thinking of it differently, why do authors write books and publishers publish them? So you and I buy them and read them. They don't publish them to data mine their own works. So this is a right that the court did not feel belonged to the copyright holders. This is a work of function. So the first factor weighs in favor of fair use, even though it's Google, it's a commercial use. Second factor, this was fair because they tried to choose books, not of fiction, but nonfiction. And third, this is another example of how courts are evolving this notion rather than a hard and fast percent rule of, well, are you taking only as much as is necessary? If you're going to build a full text retrieval system that mines data, you need 100% of the work. We've had similar cases involving student plagiarism software and other book finding and source finding mining. The fourth factor, again, you know, this is not a substitute. Um, it's just giving you a sense of aboutness. The snippet conveys a historical fact that the searcher needs to ascertain was XYZ topic talked about in this book? Oh, yes, on page 32. So this court had very little trouble concluding that this would be fair use. Then another case you may have followed involving Google was the Oracle decision involving the use of some JavaScript lines, code lines in the Android platform that Google built. And this is the most recent Supreme Court case of fair use from 2021. And the court felt, well, this use is consistent with, again, that constitutional objective of copyright, which is to promote the creative progress, to create new works. Yes, Google copied the API code, but only as so far as they needed it. They didn't have to reinvent the wheel. The second factor of this declaring code, is not to say that software is not copyrightable, it is. And the court incidentally assumed that it was in this case, but because it's a functional work, it's farther from the core of copyright than perhaps some other software programs might be. And then this is a court that actually did some of the numbers. So yes, Google copied 11,500 lines of code. Well, the API code together amounted to about 2.86 million. So close to 4%, 0.4%. The fourth factor, the evidence showed that Sun's mobile phone market was declining. And also, Google created something new, a new smartphone technology that Sun was never able to develop, taking only what was needed, putting their efforts to use, and creating a transformative new program, the Android platform. So 
in summary, as I said, most of our cases are commercial use cases. Fair use promotes innovation in the marketplace and supports it when it's a transformative use. It's something that the original rights holder did not anticipate, did not intend. Social commentary, parody, criticism, review, whether introduced in your statute by such as or including, still need to assess the four fair use factors. It's not automatically fair use in any case, but uses such as illustrations, examples, historical reference points, even if 100% is used, depends on the facts. Fair use is a mutable fact dependent analysis. Yes, we can learn from the cases. And as you implement fair use, hopefully in South Africa, you can take what you want. There are many countries in the world that are interpreting these four factors. And so it can be adapted to the situation in South Africa. Again, no derivatives. That, that is a natural market for the copyright holder. And fair use doesn't take that market away. However, our courts have over the years concluded that some works are not derivative book reviews and outline a guidebook, a lexicon. Those are all cases that we've had over the years. And so in conclusion, I, I do want to say I do support the limitations and exceptions. Uh, it will make the South African Innovation and information community being able to become, I think, the leader that it, that it should be and could be, and again, join and stand shoulder to shoulder with the rest of the countries of the world that have an accept, a robust set of exceptions and limitations. And so thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I will take any questions if you want. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for for that comprehensive uh, uh, presentation, uh, Mr. Lipinski, uh, for also sharing with us uh, how uh, the copyright in, in the USA, what are the lessons that we can learn as a, as a country, uh, as, 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 as our copyright and uh, and, and other related uh, regimes are, 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 devolved, are evolving. Uh, let me just check with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with the members uh, uh, whether they have any other uh, questions to raise. Uh, it looks like they, 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 they were quite, uh, they were quite, uh, uh, I mean, we are quite, uh, Explanatory, uh, particularly with regard to those uh, four factors, uh, which is which are, which are quite quite critical in terms of uh, uh, trying to to, 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 to to apply the fair use versus the fair dealing, how you have dealt with it with it in other yeah. in other jurisdiction. Uh, I think we are, we are quite happy. It, it's, 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 it's also building on uh, uh, on, on, on 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 what. Uh, 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 was uh, was uh, was presented earlier on by uh, uh, Nicholson. Mm -hmm. uh, there is uh, there is a correlation uh, with that. So yes. thank you and th 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 thanks a lot for for honouring us as we continue to engage with other uh, members of the public. Uh, we will at the back of our mind uh, even revisit some of these cases. Uh, you have provided us with enough material also to. Good. To learn a lot from them, uh, from those cases, or those court cases, which is able to make a clear distinction between what is fair and what is not fair. That's correct. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. pleasure. Don't be afraid of fair use. It can be a very good thing for an economy. So thank you again. Brilliant, brilliant. brilliant. So the, 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 the thought that the, 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 the just, one, just one aspect that the the uh, the role the role that the creative sector is playing in the economy uh, there there has been an assertion that uh, 
that uh, these two bills will make it uh, will, will make it difficult for the investors to invest in uh, in, in, in in the creative mm. sector uh, uh, because of the the risk uh, the risk issues raised uh, one by one by the exceptions uh, and then two uh, the invasion the invasion in terms of the contractual space what's your view in regard to that mm -hmm. yeah if I can respond to that I I would say that um, uh, and I there we do have cases involving artists and other creators um, and if it's a natural market um, it's going to be protected the courts are, are not going to see that as as fair use so as I said the sounds are examples of being uh, a sequel, a prequel, um, those will be protected. So there's there's no threat to the original um, market, the natural market that uh, an artist would, would and any other, other members of the creative interest industry would have. Um, that doesn't, that may mean that maybe if I am a scholar of media uh, and I want to um, use and talk about uh, a series of musical works, a series of graphic works, a series of motion pictures uh, that fair use would allow me to take maybe a screenshot because I want to demonstrate that example, but it's not going to allow me to show the whole movie uh, to make money for it uh, from it um, and use the whole work. I have to have a, a purpose that is criticism, illustration, example, uh, and then take only as much as is necessary. If I want to teach a film, I'm teaching a film class and I want to show a clip as an example of something. Yes. OK, then maybe I can show a sequence to my students uh, and, and educators in the States rely on fair use to do that, to demonstrate maybe an editing technique or, or some other element of the film, but not to show them the whole film that that's taking too much. So I think our, our courts do look at that. Um, and preserve that market. Obviously, we have in the States here a very, a re very robust creative industry um, because of that. Um, but documentary filmmakers, yes, can use some of those clips because they're maybe doing a history of Spielberg or a history of science fiction movies. Those could be examples that uh, uh, someone might want to use. So we haven't really seen any shying away from investing in those creative industries uh, I think, if anything, it, it it lets people build upon the shoulders of giants. Uh, and I think the fact that, you know, our GDP is so tied to exporting movies, exporting music uh, and other works of art uh, and, and the creative endeavors that uh, that is part of the robustness that you get with a, a full uh, expansion of exceptions and limitations. <laughs> No, no, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, Tom, uh, for honoring our, our invite. Uh, indeed, on behalf of the Select Committee, uh, again, a word of uh, sincere gratitude to you uh, for appearing before us. Thank you. Uh, have a wonderful afternoon. Uh, thank you. It was a pleasure and an honor to be a part of this process in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable members, we will now... Uh, uh, take uh, the next presentation, uh, uh, who will be Professor Owen Dean, uh, after Professor Thomas Lipinski, now is Professor Owen Dean. Over to you, Prof, if you are on the platform and you are ready. Do we have Professor Dean? He is on the platform, Chair, but um, I will also just ask if um, Enrico can please share his um, slide presentation because he's asked that we share it on his behalf. Okay, oh yeah, that's Prof, that's Prof, I can see him. Uh... Uh, can you hear me or am I coming through? You are coming through, Prof. Uh, you Very can good. Take the floor. Yeah, I would like you to put up my slide presentation, please. Great, great. Enrico is indeed doing that. What to you? 
Right. Um, thank you, first of all, for the opportunity to um, present to you this afternoon. I regard it as a, as a privilege and an honor to speak to such an, an esteemed audience. Um, can you put the slides on the um, the proper, you know, cut out the, the left-hand side, just have, no, that's it, right, there, there we are. And also, okay. and, uh, and also, just show your face, bro. Is my camera not on? It is not on. Let's see what it can do. Um, how do I switch it on? Um, okay, okay. Uh, let's, let's, let's proceed then. Am I now there visible? You, yeah, okay. There, there you Good. are. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, first of all, as I say, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you. I regard it as, a, as an honor and a privilege. Um, I have spoken to you once before. You might recall at the end of last year, um, I addressed you on I, uh, sort of a brief I introduction to, uh, to copyright law. Um, yeah, yeah, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed, you're correct. Uh, this is our second engagement. At the time, I, um, I gave you what my um, credentials were, but I would like to just um, repeat them in, in brief. I am a practicing attorney. I've practiced as a specialist copyright attorney for uh, the best part of 50 years. I'm also an emeritus professor at uh, Stellenbosch University um, in the field of intellectual property. I'm the author of the Handbook of South African Copyright Law, which is the standard textbook uh, used in throughout South Africa in the courts and elsewhere. And I have been described in all modesty as the doyen of copyright in South Africa by an eminent um, former judge of the, um, of the Constitutional Court. So I think it's fair to say that um, I do know something about what I'm talking about uh, when I sp speak about copyright. Can I have the next slide, please? Right there, I've set out in brief what I've just told you. Let's move on to the next um, slide. Now, the, the bill is very necessary. Let me make it quite clear at the outset that we do need to have our copyright law updated. Um, it is very old fashioned in some respects. It doesn't take proper cognizance of the digital economy. And for that reason, it certainly is in need of updating. The problem is that the present bill has serious deficiencies. Now, they can be divided into two categories. The, the first is substantial or substantive um, deficiencies, which relate to the ideological and intellectual content. In other words, the kind of thing you're providing for in the act. There are some issues about that. Now, I'm not going to address you on that issue this afternoon. I collaborated with Professor uh, Kajika of the uh, Stellenbosch University on his um, presentation, which was done on behalf of the Chair of Intellectual Property Law. And I support everything that Professor Kajika had to say. We, we jointly com uh, compiled his, his presentation. Similarly, I also subscribe to the views that were presented by the South African Institute of Intellectual Property Law. I'm a member of that organization. I was the president at some stage. Uh, so on, a, on the substantive issues, I am 100% behind what has been told to you by those people. What I'm going to talk about today are the technical deficiencies in the bill. And they relate to the draftsmanship and conformity with legal principles, including the constitutionality of the bill and general rationality and intelligibility. There are some provisions in the, in the bill which simply do not make sense. Um, what I did, and I don't know whether this has been circulated to you, I prepared a, um, a commentary on the provisions of the um, of the bill, which I consider to be technically deficient. Uh, and that document is available to you. I'm not going to deal with the detail. I'm going to talk about the general principles. Can you have the next slide, please? Now, the bottom line is that, in my opinion, the bill is poorly drafted and contains many technical defects. At least 30 have been identified. In fact, in preparing for this talk this afternoon, I went through my own material again, and I actually counted over 60 deficiencies. So there are a lot of technical problems in this bill. 
Amongst others, it does not comply with the Berne Convention and the TRIPS Agreement in several respects. Now, these are international treaties to which we belong, and we are obliged to uh, abide by these treaties. And if our law is defective in this respect, um, not only are we in breach of our obligations under the treaties, but we also um, it is also unconstitutional because our constitution requires us to comply with all international obligations which we as a country has, uh, have uh, accepted. Now, to put it bluntly, the, the, the bill is half-baked. It is almost as though we are legislating the first draft. It, it's, it's got a lot of promising material in it, but it's got a lot of gremlins in it and it needs to be ironed out. So it's, it's like the first draft of a contract or of any, any document that one might prepare. The next um, slide, please. Now I'm going to illustrate this point by reference to the blind South Africa case, which you probably have heard of. Um, what that case was about is that um, a new section 7, 19D was comprised in the bill. And the, and the purpose of section 19D was two things. The one was to create an exception uh, to copyright for purposes of making works accessible to the blind and people with other uh, disabilities. And secondly, to make our law compliant with the Marrakesh Treaty, which is a fairly recent international treaty and which has been adopted with a view to having a uniform approach to granting exceptions to blind people throughout the world. Uh, we want to accede to that treaty and our minister has gone on record as saying as much and consequently, the purpose, one of the purposes of Section 19D was to bring our law into line with the treaty so that we can accede to the treaty. Now, this Section 19D was considered by Parliament and all Parliament's legal advisors, and it was found to be good. As far as the Parliament was concerned, the National Assembly, um, there was nothing wrong with Section 19D. Of course, the bill was rejected by the president and referred back to parliament for reconsideration. And this gave right, rise to the blind South Africa case. And I've got the case and the reference uh, on the screen. Next slide, please. Can I have the next slide? Hello, can you hear me? Um, Enrico? Yes, what's happening with Enrico now? <laughs> I'm here, my dear. Okay, so you've got, I've got the next slide. Now, what was the impact, impact of the Blind South Africa case? Um, blind South Africa took the attitude, we because the bill is being delayed through the president's um, having difficulty with it, um, we want the court to read into our Copyright Act the, the, the new Section 19D comprised in the, in the amendment. So Blind South Africa brought a case before the Johannesburg High Court. The court heard the case and it, it found the, the case had been well made and it decided that made a decision to read into the existing Copyright Act uh, the new proposed section 19D. But the procedure which must be followed in this type of situation is that um, any decision like this by a provincial court has to be um, uh, ratified by the constitutional court. So, because only the constitutional court can uh, amend the constitution uh, in this way. So the case was went on review to the, the constitutional court. Um, and uh, when, the, when the hearing was conducted in the Constitutional Court, um, the Constitutional Court accepted an argument which I presented. Um, I joined the case as a, uh, as a what is called uh, an amicus curiae. Um, and the Co Constitutional Court said, well, my argument was that um, the section 19D, as it was contained in the bill, doesn't do the job. It doesn't give the blind uh, a proper exception. And moreover, it doesn't comply with the Marrakesh Treaty. Now, bear in mind that this was um, a section which 
Parliament had said is perfectly fine, it is 100%. The Constitutional Court agreed with me that it was, it was not adequate, it, doesn't, it didn't do the job. What the Constitutional Court then did was to accept the principle and to re, re, redraft the section itself, and uh, then it made an order that this section should be applied in, in the interim until the, the, um, the, the uh, Copyright Act is amended. The important factor is that the Constitutional Court took a section which had been found to be acceptable by Parliament and said it was no good. It didn't do the job that it was supposed to do. To do. It was badly drafted. And this confirms the point that I'm making, that there are many other sections in the bill which are in exactly the same situation. Parliament has approved them, but they do not do the job that they are supposed to be doing. And that is what my complaint about, and that is what I'm talking about this afternoon. Next slide, please. Next slide. My dear, it keeps on freezing. Um, just, um, just I, I will try and project it from my side. Okay, well, it's, I've got it now. So... What I say in the first point there is the Constitutional Court held that Section 19D, as approved by Parliament, was defective and unfit for purpose, despite what Parliament had to say about it. And that this confirms my point that there are many sections in other sections in the bill which suffer the same fate. In other words, what the Constitutional Court found about Section 19D is exemplary of other numerous flaws in the bill to which attention has been drawn. So I'm not making believe that there are, are flaws in the bill which, which don't do the job. There are, I found around about 60 of them and the Constitutional Court has agreed with me as far as section 19D is concerned, which is the only section that they've ever had to consider so far. Next slide, please. Now, what is the duty of Parliament? Where does Parliament sit in a situation where a bill is before it, which it is asked to pass, but which has flaws in it? And I say Parliament has a duty to the nation to make good, sensible, and unblemished laws. Parliament's legal advisors share this duty. Passing the present bill with known defects, and I have spelled them out and they're in my written documentation for those who are interested in seeing what they are, will abrogate these duties and would be unconscionable. It, it, Parliament is not doing its job properly. If it takes a bill which it has been told has deficiencies in it, the Constitutional Court has agreed, at least in one instance, that there are deficiencies in it, and it goes ahead and it enacts that as legislation. That's Parliament is not doing its job properly if, if that is the approach that it adopts. Next slide, please. Now, copyright is, is a technical subject. That is a quotation from a South African judgment. Um, and, and, and what is meant by that is that it is a very uh, esoteric and, and unusual branch of the law, and it's, it's not easy to understand. Um, I would say, personally speaking, and I've had a lot of contact in copyright circles in South Africa, that there are not a, probably not a more than a handful of lawyers in South Africa who properly understand copyright law. So truly expert knowledge is required to draft copyright legislation. You can't just take an ordinary legal draftsman who knows nothing about copyright and expect him to produce a, um, uh, a bill which is going to make good copyright sense. The drafters of the present bills, and I'm, here I include the Performance Protection Bill, have evidenced deficiencies in this regard. The fact that they could come up with a Section 19D, which the Constitutional Court said doesn't do the job properly, confirms that they are lacking in the necessary expertise to do this kind of drafting. And I say it is necessary for the bills to be referred to a drafting committee of properly recognized experts for redrafting. Now, 
my experience, both as a practitioner and as a, uh, an academic in, in the field of copyright, is such that I have come to the conclusion that you don't really get to grips with copyright in its entirety if you don't actually in, interact with copyright, if you don't enforce it or you don't, you don't apply it in practice. Now, unfortunately, many academics have a very sort of esoteric approach to these things. They've never been inside a courtroom in, and watched a copyright case in, in action. They've never handled a copyright case. They don't understand and appreciate some of the intricacies which are involved in, in copyright. That is why you need a, a proper expert drafting committee to, to, to work on the act. People who've, who've, who've worked copyright in the past, who've, who've seen what it entails and, and all the ins and outs which are involved in bringing copyright infringement litigation. It's a very complex uh, task to bring copyright infringement litigation. And at the end of the day, that's what copyright is all about. The copyright is meaningless unless you enforce it. And, you, and unless you have experience in, in, in seeing it and being enforced, you don't really get to grips with, with the subject. So an expert committee of people who have worked with copyright, not only theorized about it and, and read about it and written about it, people who have actually worked with copyright needs to, be, um, needs to deal with this, this bill. Next slide, please. Uh, what will be the consequences of passing defective bills, which I say both these bills are. Our law of copyright will be seriously compromised and the rights of creative, creative persons will be vitiated. If your, if your act is not making sense and is not doing the job that it's supposed to be doing, you're not going to be serving the people who, 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 whose interests you are supposed to be serving, namely the creative people and also the users for that matter. The integrity of parliament will be impaired. It's not a good um, new point to get out in the media that uh, Parliament has gone ahead and passed a bill which it knows has deficiencies and has just taken a very sort of cavalier kind of attitude and said, well, okay, we've worked on it for the past 14 years, we're tired of it now, so let's just pass it, even though it's got these gremlins in it. That's not going to say much about the integrity of Parliament. Our international treaty obligations will be breached. I've said to you that there are parts of this bill which are not in conformity with the Berne Convention and the TRIPS Agreement. Of both are, are, are very important uh, treaties in the field of intellectual property. And we are, we are bound in terms of international law to comply with those treaties. And we're bound by our own constitution to apply those treaties properly in our domestic law. So the acts will be, un will be constitutional, unconstitutional, and will certainly be challenged in the constitutional court. You can take poison on the fact that if this bill goes through as it is in its present form, it is going to be challenged in the constitutional court because of inter alia these deficiencies which I have highlighted and which I believe are, are, are very serious. Next slide, please. Any questions on what I've said? I hope I've made myself clear that um, I, I'm, I'm not at this point addressing the, the, uh, the substantive provisions of the, of the Act. I could talk for hours on those things like fair use, etc. But I'm not going to do that. I'm concentrating, focusing simply on the technical deficiencies of the Act. And, and my message to you is that you cannot, with a clear conscience, endorse or, or pass a bill which has been shown to have deficiencies in it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Team uh, uh, for, for bringing those uh, technical uh, uh, limitations uh, uh, from the bill. Uh, indeed, uh, you were also able to cite uh, through demonstration the recent uh, uh, concord uh, pronouncement on section 19d as part of elaborating the uh, the uh, number of uh, technical deficiencies that you have identified let me let me check uh, with the members i know that it's, uh, it's a bit uh, it's a bit late but uh, i i believe that prof uh, you have been uh, 
uh, suf sufficiently uh, un understood. Uh, more so, uh, uh, the fact that this is our second engagement uh, clearly uh, is an added uh, advantage to us uh, because uh, uh, you were you, 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 you quite, quite, quite categorical at the beginning, uh, where you would draw uh, the substantive and technical uh, uh, areas. Uh, but I think more, more, more than that, uh, the, the emphasis was on technical issues. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's compliance with the ben, ben Convention and the TRIPS agreement in several respects. You have uh, drawn us to that attention that, the, that, that this is a, a ground also for, for technical defects that you have highlighted. Uh, but, but, but more than that, uh, uh, the, 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 the added advantage from our side is that we are an amicus curiae in the, in, in the blind case, uh, which, which definitely uh, uh, says to us that uh, uh, through, 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 through your appreciation of the, of, 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 of the subject, uh, the fact that uh, it, it is your daily bread. <laughs> it made it much more easier for you to also then uh, 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 put your hand uh, up and say, uh, this matter has to be supported. Uh, but I think the, 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 uh, the, uh, the point that, 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 uh, that, that, that you raised, uh, it's what are the consequences uh, of passing the bill, uh, uh, the complexity of the subject itself, uh, when you are when you are when, when you are not uh, a, a practicing a copyright lawyer or a, or a prof, uh, were also brought forward. But I think to to to, to me, what is quite critical is. Uh, it's, 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 it's your ability to, to put forward those deficiencies to us so that as we continue to process the bill, uh, you are saying to us, these are the blind spots that you need to take a, a good a care of so that there should be no, there should be no uh, a question mark in terms of, uh, in terms of, of, in terms of uh, our ability uh, to appreciate the complex subject. But we have correctly pointed out that uh, there is there is there is there is a, uh, a document that that, that, we, that we have shared with us other than this uh, presentation. I think our team will definitely, as we move forward, uh, assist us with, uh, with with that information. But more than that, I think we also have the reservoir of of, of of knowledge that you shared with us when you when you uh, you were our guest uh, with that workshop. Thank you, Prof. Uh, let me, on behalf of the committee, uh, indeed uh, express a word of gratitude to you uh, for honoring our uh, our invite again. Thank you. Any last words? No, I, I think I've said everything I want to say. I do just urge on you to do your duty as diligent lawmakers and not to go ahead if you are convinced that there are deficiencies in the bill. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Uh, uh, for, 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 for that word of caution, uh, let's uh, then uh, express uh, uh, a word of, uh, of, 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 of gratitude to you and uh, wish you a good uh, rest uh, this late afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Thank you. <laughs> Great. You're welcome. Uh, honorable members, uh, we are. Now at a point where we must uh, take a uh, presentation from Capazo, it's Capazo, which will be represented by Mr. Nick Mansukis and also Ms. Zukiswa Gwabeni. Uh, are, are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you, are you are you on the platform? Uh, I am here, Chair. I, I do note, however, that my, um, my video camera appears not to be working. I apologize for that. Um, 
I, I, this has happened on one occasion before, and I've had to restart my machine, which with your indulgence, Chair, I, 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 I would think probably would be inconvenient at this time. Yes, I think you can you, you can you can you can restart it so that at least there is a you don't have to show as long as long as you are audible enough, it's okay. We appreciate the, the challenges you have raised. So you can you can hit the ground running. Thank thank you, Chair. My my colleague will no doubt be able to show her camera, however. Um, um thank you. Um Sorry, with your with your permission, uh, may I just uh, start? Will you be able to share? I uh, the am about to share. Yes, thank you. Uh, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps I should start just with an introduction uh, with regard to myself, Chair, um, mm -hmm. and and then I'll hand over to to my colleague. Uh, please advise whether you can, in fact, see this. Yes, 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 we can see it. Uh, well. thank, thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Nick Matsukas. I'm a lawyer. I'm a musician. Uh, I'm an author. I'm an owner of a tertiary education provider. I'm a lecturer. I'm a music industry consultant, a blogger, a music reviewer, a music reporter. I was the founding chairperson of Capasso. I was a director of the Performers Organization of South Africa and the South African Music Performance Rights Association. And I've written the only South African textbook on South African music law. I therefore come from various perspectives and uh, not just the perspective of music publishing. Thank you, Chair. I'll hand over to my, to my colleague. Thank you. Over to you, Zagizwa. Um. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a correction. Uh, my name is Tando Felison. You will also just see on the screen. Um, I am, um, yes, uh, thank you. And, so, who is Zukiswa Gwabeni? Sorry, Zukiswa was the one who was submitting, um, uh, uh, <laughs> being in communication with uh, the coordinator okay, for today. Well, yes. Thank you. I apologize for that inconvenience, Chair. Um, I just want to greet the committee. Thank you for the opportunity that has been granted to us to just make the public hearings on the Copyright Amendment Bill, which will be a main focus uh, on our presentation and on our comments. Um, as stated that my name is Tando Ferson. I am the General Counsel at Kapapo, and um, I just work... Uh, and in hand with Capasso that represents uh, composers, authors, and publishers of musical works. So our focus will be on that. Um, what we got, what my part is going to focus on solely today. Um, before I hand over to my colleague Nick, who has uh, introduced himself, uh, it's going to be CMO um, related, relating to the work that we do at Capasso, and. Um, just focusing on how these bills, if they are passed, will have an adverse effect on the work we do and on our members, who are the rights holders and the creators of music. So we've just are going to be focusing on the listed sections in, uh, in terms of my presentation today. And our first point would be on uh, the statutory damages. So, um, before we go there, we can just uh, see how the numbers are looking in terms of the parcel representation. Present, um, we 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 represent over ten thousand composed authors and publishers, and over nine million musical works locally, and over a hundred thousand of musical works within Africa alone. We also license over two hundred music users, ranging from multi-billion-dollar entities to much smaller platforms. So uh, these licenses are the people that use music, and a majority of these come from the digital platforms. So we also just collect uh, royalties and we do quarterly distributions to our members. Um, we collect over overall on our collection, 75% of these um, uh, 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 platforms, digital services, which reproduce music and which exploit the right that Capasso represents. So we know that with Capasso, it represents the creators, the composers of the work. So we know that the composers uh, of the work usually are the people that are 
are least recognized or the right that is uh, attached to the composition of the musical work is not highly recognized. So there are there is need for um, us to always make sure that representation is, is taken into account and that the bills in question can be able to cater uh, for the minority within the musical space. Luckily, um, well, not luckily, well, most of the time in our country, South Africa, you would find that the performers of musical works are also the, comp the composers of the musical works. That rights attached needs to be always focused on and it needs to be uh, realized. So in terms of our recommendations that we suggest uh, that we input in our legislation, uh, we currently, can you please move, sorry? Yes, on this one, on the statutory damages. So um, with the current, we need to be adverse of the fact that we mentioned that 75% of all our collections are from digital services. Digitization is something that cannot be run away from. It is the new age of, of consuming music. So we've seen um, in our industry, we have seen that uh, consumption in the for uh, revenues has been a loss because now we have seen that the digitization is the new consuming music as opposed to the CDs that are out there that used to be purchased. So because of that, there was a loss. Now digitization has taken over. Now that digitization has taken over, there's a need that we uh, put in place measures to hinder uh, any exploitation that has been done without compensation. And that is a result of digital parity and the infringements that take place. Such challenges are challenging to the rights holders and us as CMOs who are, are, are collecting such rights. So we require that the remedies that the bill currently in coaches to be revisited, taking into account the digital exploitations. So we've had we have we are just highlighting some of the shortcomings that have not uh, been uh, put in put in perspective on the current bill. So currently we know that Section twenty four grants are uh, um or uh, the option of having. Uh, damages, but it does, it only focuses on actual damages and a reliancy on reasonable royalty. Now the problem with actual damages, now the, uh, the problem with actual damages is that it usually takes the form for compensation for the loss of profit arising from the infringing action. So because of these infringing actions that happen, it now puts a burden on um on the rights holder who is already struggling to get their royalties, now has to take out um, uh, uh, more resources on their own to be able to prove that a big music user has infringed on their rights or that their infringement has taken place. So that puts a huge burden on a rights holder itself. And then the digitization on top of that has made it impossible for, for the musicians to actually get uh, the proof to prove uh, the actual infringements taking place because we'll see that in the macro assessment it is easy to illustrate um, on our behalf we can easily illustrate how this uh, consumption can take place for an individual to say that their single song has been infringed for them to acquire all that um access and their data and for them to understand the how uh, the audience preferences work and how the consumption pattern work on the digital services it will be um hard pressed it will be impossible task for them to say and what happens user will continue infringing the rights of the of the user so we therefore uh and then um another thing that has just also been uh, suggested sorry i'm just uh opening my slides since they are just moving and it's uh, making me lose my train thoughts sorry about that and then on the other hand the reasonable royalty also it relates to an amount that potential licensees or potential music or the music users would have to be paid uh, meaning that if an infringer can just persist on their illegal action and and easily assume the risk of only have ever having to pay the royalties they would have paid in the first place had they not bona fide or had they not infringed in the first place. Now this would mean that the rights holder now would have to be able to ascertain 
how uh, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the infringer would have acquired uh, some kind of profits based on the infringement that would have happened. This is also putting undue pressure on the rights holder itself. And then oh, we are currently, it's also just the, the, the burden of funding the assessment despite not being financially viable to sue. Um, currently, we know that the aim of the uh, of the bills is to redress um, the, the 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 injustice of the past. We have seen an increased rise of our creators and our musicians dying of paupers. So such um, provisions um, and um, the lack of uh, having more remedies within the bill would also just uh, uh, increase those injustices of the past instead of redressing them. So we recommend uh, to the committee, we recommend that it is imperative that statutory damages be introduced in the bill above the reasonable royalties contemplated already in the section. And this is particularly important if the policy is to introduce general exceptions such as fair use, statutory damages, are deterrents, they are important. They are crucial components on how these general, general exceptions would work. This would also just empower uh, uh, the, the rights holders itself if they don't have to have a burden. Instead, they would rely that an infringement has indeed taken place and then statutory inclusions can be made on how that can be uh, improvised. So um, it, it will also just release the burden on our courts. We know that uh, currently in our court systems, the burden would be so huge for them to be able to uh, cater for each and every um, uh, uh, a court case that comes to prove infringement, whereby the jurisprudence now will also just lie in the courts for them to state on how they would now uh, ascertain whether an infringement has taken place or not. So we improvise that the 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 the, the the statutory damages be included. This is also just to incorporate a fair use exception alongside the fair dealing, which we are of the opinion that it is jurisprudently incompatible. Fair use is wide and general exception, they are wide, is a wide and a general exception. Whereas fair dealing is closed in most specific list of exceptions, which the courts won't have even a problem determining. Whereas fair use will now have to be dependent on on, on various doctrines and it requires frequent and continuous litigation to develop a, a jurisprudent and norms. By default, authors and rights holders are once burdened with the task of instituting, developing much needed jurisprudence around fair use. Now, it will be um, uh, pertinent to also know that litigation processes can take up to three to four years, if not more, uh, depending on a case by case basis. This would put such undue pressure on the rights holders, not only financially, but also um, in a wider aspect as well. But should the committee be fast, we recommend that a statutory damage be introduced in the in bills. And then we move on to um, uh, another aspect that we um, that we are of the opinion that the committee can be adding as a remedy for the rights holders. This is all impacted based on the general exceptions um, that have been introduced in our law. So exceptions for libraries specifically and archives are born out of the Bangwai agreements under Annex Chair 8. The agreement places a number of conditions in the implementation of this exception, and that is the two-step test, which means that the reproduction should not be for commercial purposes, either direct or indirectly, should be met with the request of a natural person for the preservation, replacement, or archiving. So current articulation seeks to attend the, this exception to include lending or granting access in digital means and to include library or archives as beneficiaries due to the exceptions that are in the Bengwa in the uh, Bangwai agreement. The agreement also expressly states that the authors of literary and artistic work performance in respect of their performance fixed on phonograms and phonogram and phonogram producers shall be entitled to remuneration for the production of such works, performances and, and phonograms 
a need for strictly personal and private use and made in accordance with the provisions. Additionally, the extension into the digital use further requires that libraries that benefit from this exception put in place protection measures that ensure that the work is subsequently used for other purposes, especially not infringements. So this is uh, generally wide exception. There is a need now to have a balance on uh, allowing the exceptions, which means that the work of the rights holder will be exploited without any compensation. However, now we are stating that the balances of, uh, uh, of, intro of introduction of these exceptions that something like a private copy compensate, private copy levy be introduced into the system. By introducing a system of private copy compensation to compensate right holders for the loss of income as a result of these wide exceptions and limitations that the bill introduces. This would also just be in line with other uh, countries that have also just introduced private copy com levies in light of the exceptions that are being introduced. So these countries like Botswana, Algeria, France have already um, uh, established private copy compensation to be introduced with the bill in light of the general exceptions that are being encroached in the current bill. And then uh, to move on, um, um, uh, in uh, from the other sections that also just uh, uh, an adverse effect uh, on our members as well. Uh, the definition of a royalty, which is currently under Section 6A. So this was also just highlighted by uh, the previous speaker of uh, Barker McKenzie as well. So we also just of the of same opinion. To say the definition, to the definition of royalty to mean gross profit made up and the exploitation of work, which is employed in section 6A is highly prejudicial to the very people it seeks to protect. As far as musical works are concerned, this definition is potentially to affect the royalty flow of authors and composers in the contemporary music publishing environment, which authors, composers are, are the members of, uh, uh, are the beneficiaries of such. And such music works, they earn a share of royalties that are calculated at percentage of the total turnover, which is our recommendation to um to the committee that um if 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 we were to go with the cross profit, it would mean that most of uh, the rights holders would have their works being exploited, having no remuneration at all or no compensation at all. So it would be noteworthy to state that royalties are shared from the first cent which any work generates. So this practice guarantees that the composer, the composer's royalties are payable, even if the publisher or the musical work is not a turning is not turning a profit. So the new definition has the potential to be interpreted to authorize publishers to deduct their costs. To, to authorize the music the music users to deduct their cost from royalty provision prior to distributing to the composers and authors. There are huge um, the consequences as well, where we see that um, big uh, uh, DSPs um, will be generating at a loss, but they would in none, nonetheless be exploiting the music uh, belonging to the creators and the rights holders. Thus, royalty should be defined as a percentage of a total turnover or revenue generated by the musical work as opposed to gross profit. And that is our recommendation. And just to move on to um, uh, sections that are, are, are highly effective to DMO related uh, 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 functioning. Um, this is our section 22A, which is uh, in relation to the open works. So this uh, we um we are uh, putting before the committee that such a proposal would frustrate um, uh, um would frustrate the aim that is trying to make instead of instead of um, making the often works become uh something that is a solution for uh the current situation. So um CMOs have already do have the mechanisms in place. Uh, we had already stated that uh, in, in light of the licensing of 200 so music users, part of uh, the research that goes in parts, that goes hand in hand with um, the licensing 
is a research related and increasing uh, the databases assessed by the very same users. So because we have mechanisms in place, we are able to be able to identify any rights holders and it is with, well within uh, the finance, within uh, control of the CMOs. The process contemplated in the bill would just rather frustrate rather than assist. So we recommend that the music industry should be exempted from the open works regime. And we recommend further that the committee uh, 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 seek to empower CEOs for um, the research and databases that they are continuously increasing to identify the rights holders in the open works. And um, we look at an example like um, the MLC, which is the Mechanical Licensing um, CMO in America, which is doing exactly uh, what we as CAPASO are currently doing and other CMOs as well. Uh, it is empowered by legislation within the country to be able to do so and has uh, had a success in collection and distribution and also attaining the rights holders of the world. So if we were to get that empower, we would be able to uh, process. We're already dealing with UNDOC and um, we are just be, being able to always just being able to process. Also dealing with the rights holders is that we get um, data, we get uh, information on who are the rights holders that are mostly being, uh, where their music is being exploited. And uh, the that information as a CMO, the research makes it easier for us to be able to uh, locate and do further uh, uh, um, uh, assistance in, in terms of locating the rights holders. And it is noted that uh, the matter of open works is uh, a, a problem not only nationally, but uh, collectively, uh, um, globally, it is an, uh, an issue. But within the current situation, the current uh, standing within the CMOs, this is um, already uh, uh, something that is uh, uh, being dealt with within the CMO. What we require from the committee is that reinforcement and the establishment of a uh, of um a uh, uh, extended repertoire system and that being empowered onto the CMOs so that we are able to do more than we are currently doing. And uh, when we are moving on to section 22, uh, which deals to ensure that CMO are available and work. So this clause in section 22 generally concerns provisions that seek to ensure that CMOs are accountable and work to serve the interest of their members. However, there is a need to guide against the faults of a one-size-fits-all approach, which tends to plague parts of the bill. It is not always feasible or financial prudent for local CMOs to enter into bilateral agreements with foreign CMOs. As it's currently quoted, uh, as it's currently quoted is that we need to enter into bilateral. But in fact, at times it proves to be it proves to be strategic to enter into uni unilateral agreements with foreign CMOs in the interest of the local authors and copyright owners. By way of illustration, certain CMOs who all enter into varying varying types of agreements, some bilateral, others uni unilateral with a South African CMO. So sometimes it would be proving to be more um, uh, beneficial to enter into a un unilateral agreement as opposed to a beneficial, as, a, as opposed to a bilateral agreement. So there we suggest that the clause simply read that um, the remittance of royalties is subject to a reasonable and valid agreement between the foreign CMOs and the local one, as opposed to just simply saying bilateral agreements. And then um, in closing, before I hand over to uh, my colleague, I just want, uh, we just want to also just emphasize on section 22F, which um, uh, the provisions of this section tend to empower the commission, even at the expense at the best interest of the members of the CMOs, which is being regulated. It is pertinent to note that CMOs are run by, a, are a member organization and are operating on the mandate by the holders.
So the commissioner cannot act outside of this mandate or without the consultation of the members that it represents. So that will, it will, it will effectively just um, the control that it, it seems to control, it will actually prejudice the members that it seeks to protect. So prior to the applying to the tribunal, the, the commission must be required to consult the members and empower them to run the affairs of their organization. And uh, we have just proposed wording that can be added into subsection 5, section 2022F. And uh, we've just listed how the process would go if um, if uh, this was to continue and how we you would work hand in hand with the members that you are seeking to uh, protect and how uh, they the involvement can just take place. The wording is suggested and it is also um, part of the of the of the written submissions that have been already made. Uh, with that said, thank you, committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. And most of the other things are uh, obviously uh, attended even more in more detail within the written submission. I now hand over to uh, Nick Matukis. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tanda. Chair, I'm mindful of time, so I'll be as brief as I can. Um, Chair, this uh, the. The Copyright Amendment Bill, in, indeed both bills, uh, appear to be um, ev evident, evidently bills that were passed by Parliament with good intentions, with very good intentions, but with the worst possible results. It's most certainly true, as Professor Dean pointed out earlier, that we need the law to be updated. There's no doubt about that. But the music industry, having looked at these bills from any angle that it can, and once again, I wear many, many hats, simply cannot accept these bills in their current forms. And um, we reiterate that the state president sent them back and, and, and sent them back for good reason. I will start with uh, our perspective from, as the music industry on the matter of fair use, which has been introduced into our law. We have until this point had uh, a very clear, closed and, and uh, predictable list of exceptions called fair dealing. And they, uh, they've been gone through numerous times. And it, it, we understand these provisions. They are predictable. They have... Uh, served us well, and they are indeed variable by section by the Minister promulgating regulations under Section 13 of the existing Act. Fair use, on the other hand, which has been uh, uh, introduced by these, by these bills, by the Copyright Amendment Bill in particular, is a far more open-ended, vague and unpredictable notion than fair dealing, and it will create uncertainty in our view it will result in judge-made law. Um, it is Parliament who, who who should be setting the laws, not the judiciary. And uh, our view is that different courts, as has happened in America, will reach different conclusions and, and unpredictability will be the result. If one takes but two uh, examples from the American music industry, the case of Sofa Entertainment versus Dodger Productions, in which uh, a, a clip of the Four Seasons being interviewed by Ed Sullivan um, was then used by, by the producers of, of, of an off-Broadway musical called The Jersey Boys. They used this, uh, they, they used it without permission, they used it without remuneration, and when sued by the owners of that very valuable copyright, um, they just simply raised their hands and said, no, it's fair use. And not only did it, did it cost the owner of that, of that copyright much, but in, in respect of time and legal expenses in order to try and enforce their copyrights, but the result went against them, which cannot have been fair. Um, the judge held that they uh, that the defendant had used it without usur usurping existing demand. Well, this was not really the point. The point was that the defendant had had made massive amounts of money out of the use of this clip, uh, albeit in in a transformative way for a different purpose. That was not really the point. And again, in the case of Campbell versus Akafaro's music, the well known group Two Live crew did a parody of the famous song Oh Pretty Woman by Roy Orbison 
and simply put their hands up and said, fair use, sue us, uh, prove it, prove that it's not fair, the onus of proof, of course, being on the plaintiff. And even though they made millions of dollars out of this, Roy Orbison's poor family um, received no nothing uh, as a result of the application of fair use. I, I, I raised this chair not because it was necessarily unfair, but because it shows what the unpredictability of fair use has been in America. And the same will happen here. In fact, worse will happen here. Now, fair use and fair dealing for that matter must, if promulgated into law, they must pass what is known as the three-step test. We have an obligation to adhere to the three-step test, which um, uh, has been gone through, I, I would think, earlier today. But uh, the point about, about these uh, the three-step step test, and I wasn't present for, for Pro Professor Kajika's presentation, but I'm sure he would have gone through this, uh, is that in a consecutive way, all three requirements of the three-step test must be satisfied. If any one of them consequentially is, is lacking, then the law does not satisfy our international treaty obligations. And the fact of the matter is that fair dealing does satisfy the three-step test, but fair use most certainly does not, not in the way in which it has been drafted in the Copyright Amendment Bill. Um, Fair use entitles the court to make a decision. It, it allows the court to use a discretion. The court can decide what actions are quote unquote fair and which actions are not. And this means that the predictability will go out of our law. And that cannot be a good thing for, 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 for any creative industry. Not only that, but the onus of proof will be on the creator or on the owner of the copyright. And in our opinion, in the music industry at any rate, this will, this will result in a free for all. Again, it's a breach of our international treaties. Um, it, 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 it's, it's peculiar to American copyright law and it's underpinned by certain principles of, of American copyright law. And as has been pointed out by, by my colleague, we do not have the deterrent of punitive damages in South African law. If we did have punitive damages, as the Americans do, then there, there would be a deterrent to simply use uh, copyrights owned by others and, and put one's hands up and say, well, uh, this is fair use. The onus is on you to prove that it's not. Because if indeed it is proved that it's, that it's not fair use, there would, there would be highly significant cost and punitive damages in, 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 imposed on the defendant. That dynamic simply does not exist in South Africa. And it, it, it simply cannot, it, 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 it simply therefore will, will result in what I've called a free for all. Not only this, but uh, the legislator has drafted what appears to be a hybrid here by using the word such as, which has been referred to earlier, and by creating a, a kind of a hybrid of, of fair use, which is an open-ended exception, and fair dealing, which is a closed list uh, of exceptions. It, it must be one or the other. It cannot be both, yet, yet this provision seeks to do both. The, the, the result will be utter and absolute uncertainty, more uncertainty than, than exists even in America, where there have been hundreds, dare I say, thousands of cases. Now, speaking of that matter, what what then will be the situation? Will will we, when this law is 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 signed by the state president, will we then uh, be required to rely on American precedent and American case law in order to determine what is fair and what is not? Surely, surely that cannot have been the legislator's intention. And yet, this is precisely what will happen. I most certainly, as a creator would not want to be the first person to have to go to court to determine whether something is fair or not, or not, whether the use of my work by another without permission is fair or not. The uncertainty would, would, would just be overwhelming and, and the risk would be too great. And it is our contention, Chair, that, that what, what the, um, the proponents of, of this fair use uh, provision are doing is, is simply propagating 
the uh, the uncontrolled use of copyrighted works by the by the large digital service providers without any consequence and that that can surely not be in the interests of our of our creative economies it has been suggested that fair use is necessary in order to future proof our law this is by no means the case section 13 as i've observed earlier of our current act provides flexibility. It allows the minister to make new exemptions in our regulations, as he indeed did with private copying. And th we therefore have future proofing in our law. And as Professor Dean uh, stated in, in an article that he wrote recently, in general, it is companies that operate vast databases of easily accessible digital information where copyright is a hindrance to their operations that argue that any action that is fair on the part of a user of a work constitutes a certain special case. It is submitted that this proposition defies logic and common sense and is untenable. And we certainly, as the music industry, agree with that view. It appears that big technology has an agenda. And we believe that that agenda is greater than the South African one. It's our view that this in, in, international experiment is being conducted with our law in order for us to be waived in front of the rest of the world and for the argument to be made, oh, look, South Africa, who have the most advanced constitution in the world and a wonderful Bill of Rights and one of the negotiated settlements politically in the world, and I don't know, for that matter, the most advanced divorce law. Now look at what South Africa has done. They have created this open-ended exemption to their law. And as, 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 we, round, as we round up, uh, uh, yes. because I see that uh, you, uh, you have almost, you have exhausted your time. Uh, you can just round up. Please. Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll, I'll do so. I'll limit my, my comments to that. Um, we do, we also do not accept the 25 year reversion, and I, I, I'm I'm happy to refer to a written representation that I've that I've made in in that case. The, the 25 year reversion is an aberration of what was previously called the Dickens clause, which is that the copyright should revert to the author 25 years after his death. It should not have been. Uh, a simple 25 year limit on assignment that is not what the what the crc uh, report requested and there has been an aberration we have lost sight of the crc report um often works my colleague has 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 covered technical uh, uh, tpms as they are known we do not feel that the bill does enough to address uh, the matter of piracy, for example, why website blocking has not been has not been provided for is is beyond us. We think that there are also very many missed opportunities in the bill. The ephemeral exemption should have been uh, uh, deleted from our law. It it, it it is problematic. The Intellectual Property Laws Amendment Act, which allows works to come out of uh, the public domain into copyright again for traditional communities is simply unworkable. The, the regulations have not been, been promulgated many years later, and we don't believe that they that they can be because they are unworkable. We don't agree with state-controlled copyrights. We think there is in, uh, in lack of clarity on, on the ownership of commissioned works and the default situation where there is no written contract. We believe also that, as has been pointed out, uh, the international treaty obligations that we have have been have been missed and uh, have been breached. And we we also believe that uh, the procedural problems surrounding the bill are myriad. Many submissions have been ignored, and uh, <coughs> the 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 omission of a proper impact assessment chair. Uh, um, is simply unacceptable, and we therefore oppose, as the music industry, the promulgation of these bills. Thank you, Chair. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, thank you, Nick, uh, and Tando for the, uh, the detailed presentation. Uh, uh, we note uh, the thrust of uh, what you have uh, presented. Uh, uh, I think your view is that uh, while, while the bill seeks to offer some measure of protection 
for the most vulnerable authors and uh, copyright owners. Uh, there is a word of caution uh, that you are raising uh, against against the bill, and there are a number of proposals uh, that we have uh, that we have made. Uh, and uh, your view is that with the advent of digital authors and copyright owners, we now require more flexibility in how they, they manage their individual affairs. And that the one says uh, all approach is not a contemporary approach uh, to empowerment. I think that is the, the case that the, the, the issues that we have raised. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, also the issue also made reference to, 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 to the assertion that every contractual relationship entered into, into by others and people right uh, should be objectively reasonable. And uh, uh, clearly there are a number of uh, areas uh, that, that you have identified and say, we are not in support of the bill. I think we know that. I think what is quite critical is uh, uh, the, <clears throat> the true presentation from Tando and yourself. Put us in a much more also better position to know where you come from. It's an area that is quite complex and uh, such inputs from your side uh, are indeed of benefit to the select committee to help you arrive at the right decision. And on that note, uh, let me, on behalf of the select committee, uh, indeed extend a word of gratitude to, to yourselves uh, and the team for honoring our invite. Uh, and that uh, uh, as, we, as, as we continue to grapple with this, uh, with this bill, uh, your input will come in handy. Thank you a lot, uh, Prof. I mean, uh, uh, Tango thank and also uh, Nick. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, um, thank you, Tando. Uh, Chairperson, if I may, um, the next presenter is Dr. Dikku Wuya. Um, unfortunately, he has had to leave. He's got a, a doctor's appointment that he can't miss, and he's unable to brief the committee next week. So he's actually asked Ms. Denise Nicholson um, to present the presentation, his presentation on his behalf. Okay, is Nick ready? Um, I am. I am ready. Can you hear me? Can you hear yes, me? Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. We can hear you. Okay. Dick Kahua is in the US, and uh, he definitely wanted to present at the slot, but because of the time span, he has another commitment that he can't break. So he apologizes and um, asked if I could please um, stand in for him. I'm doing this at very short notice, so I'm going to be very quick. Um, what I wanted to say is that Dick uh, Kawua um, is the Associate Professor at the School of Information Science at the University of South Carolina. And he has been very involved in intellectual property and copyright issues in Africa for many years and at WIPO. He has attended many WIPO meetings at Geneva where proposals for treaties for research, education, libraries and archives have been on the agenda of the Standing Committee for Copyright and Related Rights for more than about 10 years. Um, South Africa, as part of the Africa Group, has supported these proposals for an international instrument. Nick has worked in South Africa and comes to South Africa regularly, so that is why he also thought he would, could make a, a, a contribution. Um, Dick supports fair use in our bills, as well as the exceptions for libraries and archives, museums and um, archives, education, uh, sorry, education and research, and for the persons with disabilities. His experience as an academic, lecturer, and postgraduate student from Uganda, living in US, has been very positive for him, um, especially with regard to access to knowledge, teaching, and research. Um, fair use has been exceptionally useful for him and his own in his own studies. Um, in his own work and also for his students. Um, so much that can be done under fair use in the US, which cannot be done in South Africa. Um, he can uh, use South African publications on a daily basis if he wants to under fair use, but we can't use his publications the same way because we don't have fair use. Um, I just wanna see what other, uh, I'm just giving you a bit of detail about him, but uh, you can read that later. I'm just going to say what he wanted me to say. 
Um, even if South Africa only had one example under Section 12A, um, they could still do all the acts listed because of the flexibility of fair use, uh, using the word such as. Similarly, people in the US can do all the acts listed in the CAB as they are listed due to the flexibility of words such as or including as Malaysia has. Um, also remember the US has many other useful exceptions uh, as well for education and disabled people, et cetera. Um, the provisions for library and archives, especially for digitization and digital curation in the bill are welcome. Dick has recently been in Cape Town and is aware of the fires at the UCT and parliament. And so much of the lost African studies collection at UCT that was burnt or damaged so badly could have been prevented or mitigated if more works could have been digitized. Unfortunately, our law doesn't allow digitization without authorization. So it's a very slow and expensive process. Um, the bill will ensure preservation and ongoing curation of special collections, historical records and cultural heritage for future generations. It will enable legal deposit collect, uh, libraries to continue to collect, preserve, and make South Africa's cultural heritage accessible for everyone now and in the future. Dick also is pleased to see orphan works have been considered in the bill, but he believes that fair use would be more applicable, but suggests that the clause be changed to allow use of orphan works, especially anonymous or pseudonymous works or works where uh, organizations are totally defunct that they're made available at least for uh, research um, and education purposes. Um, Dick is also happy to see the inclusion of unenforceable contracts, which will, present, uh, will prevent um, contract law overriding lawful acts or exceptions, which has been the practice for decades. And um, the uh, Singapore and the EU have got these um, uh, provisions in their laws as well. Regulation of collecting societies is long overdue, according to Dick. It is time they uh, became open and accountable so that authors and creators and performers and art actors can benefit from royalties. Um, I hope I have covered all the aspects that Dick wanted to share. Obviously, he was going to give you a lot more detail, but I've just given it to you in a nutshell. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak on behalf of Dick. Um, he has got a few um, things listed there. He's, um, thank you very much for allowing me to speak because um, he can't also make it next week. Um, but he did say that if you've got any queries, um, you're welcome to um, contact him at the address on the program. Um, he was very keen to speak, but unfortunately he's not able to because of the delay, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Denise Nicholson for coming to uh, Dick Gauria as rescue uh, by uh, uh, giving us a, an account in terms of uh, his view, uh, particularly given his uh, proximity to the country, uh, though he's based in the School of Information Science in the University of South Carolina. Clearly he has a, 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 a grasp and an appreciation of uh, uh, the uh, uh, fair use, uh, as we have co correctly pointed out. And I think the committee, uh, would like to extend uh, a sincere word of gratitude to him through you, uh, Nicholson. Uh, you have done wonders. Uh, and uh, on behalf of the State Committee, again, a word of gratitude to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Honorable <clears throat> uh, members, uh, let's then uh, check where we are now. Uh, the, the Writers Guild of South Africa, is that where we are? Yes. Yes, can we then uh, invite uh, Mr. Stein uh, to take the podium? Over to you. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you to the committee. Uh, in the interest of brevity, I will not go into the technicalities too much. All of those are addressed in our written submissions, which I'm sure will be made available at an appropriate time through the appropriate forums. I've also, um, I'm also joined by my colleague from the Writers Guild, Theoline, who will take on the second part of my presentation. So I will deal with a few, just touch on a few points, and then she will go into the impact of or what um, the bill will have on the Writers Guild and the industry 
which I think is the most important thing, um, to listen from stakeholders, as I'm sure the committee would agree. Briefly, um, I just want to make sure that you see my, my screen. Uh, not yet. We can only see you. Okay, no, uh, no problem. Good. Yeah, there you are. There you are. Okay, perfect. So, re regarding the the bill um, and regarding the the actual submissions from the guild, we decided to focus on four main points. Now, before I start, I do need to make it clear that the guild is not against the entirety of the bill but also not for the entirety of the bill. Um, I'm sure a lot of stakeholders would agree that the bill, is not all, um, the bill is not all bad, but it is definitely not all good either. And um, that, that we do want to make clear. The fact that we are pointing out specific concerns does not take away from the positive impact the bill might, might have on other points. That said, like some of our colleagues um, definitely said, and yeah, I want to specifically mention, mention Prof Dean, my colleagues from Capasso today, and on a previous occasion, my colleagues from CIPL, where they went into detail about those concerns and the fact that irrespective of the good of the bill, if there are concerns, if there are shortcomings, those shortcomings definitely need to be addressed. As stated by Prof Dean, it's a duty on Parliament to ensure that the bill is sound and supports well public but also what the bill is actually intending to do and to be fair the bill was originally intended to look after the creators which i'm sure at the end of of my my presentation you will you will um, agree with me or at least some members would agree with me that it unfortunately falls short of that so it's coming short of its original intent to protect the creators of South Africa. So briefly going to the definitions, like I said, I won't elaborate on it too much. The definitions, there are various shortcomings on the definitions. And also, I think the drafters of the bill, or we feel the drafters of the bill missed the opportunity to elaborate on certain points. They, for instance, tried to, um, or they, they included dramatic words under literary works. Although looking at those principles, it's unfair to do, do so. It is not adequate to just bundle a specific, um, a specific principle under another principle. It would have dire effects down the line. Um, and there, there's in our present, uh, in our written submissions, we actually made specific reference to at least two um, definitions were, which were lacking, and we did offer alternatives in in um, line with other legislations that have similar principles in their legislation where those are adequately addressed. Here again, I would refer to dramatic works because dramatics works and audiovisual works, although they are related, cannot be viewed as the same, which people in the industry, especially in the writer's industry, would know. Second point is the, the concerns with royalties and remuneration. And here again, I think my, my colleagues from Capasso did elaborate on that as well as the fair use um, instances in quite a lot of detail. So I do not feel it's necessary for, for us to rehash that again. Like I said, a lot of stakeholders already pointed out in very technical detail what those concerns would be. And we would feel that that in itself which we support, there is a lot of concerns on those points, would be sufficient for this committee to, to realize that CAP should not be adopted in its current form. It's, it's definitely something that needs to be addressed because it will have an impact on the actual communities and the actual creators and ultimately the industries, which is a financial impact and economic impact which this bill is seeking to, to address. Um, just briefly on, on the actual royalties and fair remuneration, the bill seeks to, if I can put it like that, put all industries under a one-size-fits-all policy, which it cannot do. Industries differ, irrespective of in which position you are. Yes, all are related to copyright, but whether you are a writer or a filmmaker or a musician, 
each one of those industries differ and they have their own principles and have their own methods and ways of dealing with royalties as well as dealing with fair remuneration. What would be reviewed, um, referred to as fair remuneration in relation to the filmmakers would not necessarily be fair to a musician and vice versa. Furthermore, looking at fair remuneration in itself, those need to be focused on not only the industry but also projects. Now, prescribing certain points there without having a negotiation term is what a concern is. And here, again, um, as we did in our written submissions, we would have we wanted to propose simply or at least the ability to to say that in the absence of a contract or an agreement to the contrary the following minimum principles would uh, would um, be followed that said it still needs to be a decision by the creator to deal with their creation it needs to be related to industry and it needs to be a fair choice if we can put it like that yes follow minimum requirements minimum standard but give them the opportunity to negotiate beyond that, depending on various factors. Um, furthermore, regarding the 25-year limitation and the contractual freedom aspect, again, yeah, without going into too much detail, it, it is essential to understand the impact, and I'll, I'll deal with that in a bit more in a f um, further slide, but the impact these limitations and the lack of adequate contractual freedom would have on well, the Writers Guild and their members, but other industries pertaining to copyright as well. It is something that needs to be addressed. 25-year limitation will have a dire impact on the economy, uh, economic aspects of these industries. And not being able to freely contract around certain restraints is an issue. Um, and then naturally fair use. But I do believe everybody already touched on fair use, so I will not go into that. In partial summary, just looking at the implications of, of, of CAB as it stands, again, I reiterate, there are a lot of positives addressed in CAB and in the bill, but the implications of it as it currently stands is, is summarized in the fact that it is putting additional strain on industries that are already under severe stress. Creators are, are the most praised parts of society. We love our filmmakers. We love our artists. We love our musicians. We aspire to be like them. Yet they are the worst paid and worst off than all of us. We all know the term a struggling artist or a struggling musician. Why do we put additional strain? And, and yeah, I can emphasize it will be a financial strain on these creative industries. Ultimately, the result will be, and I, I, I mentioned there, it's court proceedings under the fair use. Like again, my colleagues from Capasso um, emphasized what the court proceedings implications would be. There's contractual limitations, so you would not be able to negotiate a decent remuneration with maybe a foreign investor or foreign interest in, in, in our case, in written works or in, in screenplays because of the limitations, the 25-year limitations. And I'm not allowed to go beyond that because I have a restriction and a limitation on my contractual freedom. And then compensa compensation, we can go on and on about. But, but the fact is there's going to be a, a strain on already struggling industry. And I do not think that is fair or actually something we want to do. We will stifle the industries. We will stifle creativity and entertainment. And basically what makes South Africa this rich cultural economy is going to be stifled through certain aspects of CAB as it currently stands. This brings me to the economic impact it will have. Now, what taking an example, and I I did mention this in our um, written submissions, but taking an example of a, a, a high-valued television or, in this case, streaming series, the impact in industry is that it is required for, for multi-authored works to be um, compiled into a single ownership to be able to effectively commercialize that 
that bundle that is going forward. Um, and to be able to do that, assignment of various works needs to be done beyond the current limitations the Act prescribes. Nobody, and yeah, I, I refer to local investors, local developers, but also, which we know in the industry is, is on the rise, is foreign um, in, uh, investors into South African creations and creativity, especially films and, and television series. They would steer clear of, of creatives or of local content where there is limitation, where they are unable to freely negotiate and freely contract with the creators. And here, it, it is a higher economic impact because the creators would not be able to make a proper living where the impact would be they would not want to create. They'll find other jobs where they can make a living. So the local creations, the local works, the local screenplays, the local um, novels will die out because they are not incentivized to create. Yes, it's a short-term benefit CAB presents, but at what cost? What is the price we are going to deal with? How much will we lose down the line? And um, a previous presenter actually mentioned about the, the concern about not being able to digitize work, which I agree with. There is a concern. And CAB, to an extent, addresses that specific concern. However, the concern now raised in CAB is what will be left to digitize if nobody creates? And that is my question. That comes down to that main um, impact is why would anybody create if they are not remunerated to create, if they cannot make a living from it? And what, what will we have to show the future generations of our rich and vibrant, like I mentioned, social and cultural economy? And I think that, that, is, that is where I would leave you with, with that point, to say, look at what CAB was intentionally, uh, originally intended to do. It was intended to make a better world in the copyright sense to those who create. And unfortunately, with, with the utter respect for the drafters and every, everyone, it was missed. The, the, it was far missed looking at the whole of it, purely because of those specific, not only the ones we highlight, but ones other stakeholders highlighted. Those specific shortcomings and those specific issues CAB is introducing as it currently is. And, and it is just one thing, and here I want to just reiterate what Prof. Um, Dean mentioned, is copyright is a highly technical aspect. And each one of the areas of copyright, music, literary, um, audiovisual works, all of those have very specific specialists in those um, areas dealing with it. Uh, I mean, um, Owen Dean rightfully said there's only a handful of true copyright specialists in our country, which I regard Prof. Dean as being one. So my view, and here I urge the committee and parliament ultimately to at least consider further including those technical legal specialists in re-looking at CAB making sure it is sound and making sure it addresses what it needs to address, making sure it looks after the people and the creators it is supposed to do. Um, and I, I did cover the that in my conclusion now, but like I said, it's not just my conclusion. I would here want to um, just hand over to, to my colleague, Theoline, who is a member of the Writers Guild, to just address just go on to a, a few points and mention there what her concerns would be and what she would deal with if CAB goes through as it currently is. Celine? Hello, can you see me? Yes, yes, we can yes. see you. Uh... Hi there. I don't have a presentation, but I would like to say thank you for this opportunity. We really, really appreciate it. As my colleague mentioned, I am a member of the Writers Guild. I've been a member since its inception. 
I was one of the people that actually signed it in to, to what it is today. And really what I've noticed is that most of our members join in when they're in trouble with producers and they expect us as a guild to help them with their challenges. And we as a guild, our main purpose is to try and protect them and empower them and develop them. What I have noticed as somebody who has no legal background and somebody who could be seen as a general member of the public is that the current law and the bill doesn't see us as who we are. We see ourselves as performance writers, we see ourselves as creators who create work that is to be performed and not to be published. This means that what we write is to be either seen on stage or heard on the radio or be seen on television or at the cinema. Like performers and like performers or actors, we are atypical workers. We are freelancers. We depend on our art. We are often exploited and we often die as paupers. And unlike our performers and actors, nobody knows who we are. But you consume our work. And what we're really asking is that we are seen as creators of dramatic works. How we get our work on screen is we have to work through producers. We write the script, but for it to end up on your screens, we have to work through producers who currently the bill sees as authors of audiovisual work. Now, I tell you right now, the production process, as most people or some of my colleagues have said today, involves multiple people. And to say that the producer is the sole author of audiovisual work, where does it leave us if currently we're seen as workers of literary work? but our work becomes work that you consume on television or at the cinema. We have to sign away our copyright so that producers can get our work to the streamers, to the broadcasters. Sometimes we're not compensated for it. We are exploited with little to no recourse. And even with an existence of a signed contract, um, we don't have the power to, you know, to negotiate, similar to actors and performers. And now the bill expects us to go to court, people who don't have the money, don't have the means, with what resources? How are we going to be able to afford a lawyer to fight on our behalf? And in the rare event, when we are compensated for our work, the little contractual freedom that we did have will be further affected by the bill as it stands. You heard the content producer say that if these laws, um, if the bill is passed, um, producers will refuse to invest in our content. What will our country look like if we no longer have local content, if you no longer can consume our stories by our people? While we understand that these new additions are supposed to protect us, as I've mentioned, they do end up weakening our ability to negotiate our contracts. What we are asking as performance writers is for you, our lawmakers, and often consumers of our content, is that the law sees us as creators of dramatic work, where we can decide whether or under what conditions our work may be used, produced, and distributed by others. Because ultimately, isn't that what owners of copywriters have to do after all? Thank you for your time and your opportunity. Thank, Thank you, you Theoline. Uh, Theoline and, uh, and uh, uh, maybe we must check uh, with the members uh whether they have any clarity seeking questions uh, from your presentation uh, i just got a bit of uh, uh, 
one to two questions just on the chat. The <clears throat> When 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 the when uh, things started, he raised the the fact that they are neither against no uh, they are not against the the bill per se, but however they are also not in favor because of certain areas. Uh, what, what I want to check with him is, uh, is, is uh, <clears throat> whether in terms of uh, what the bill introduces, uh, like the uh, dramatic word, uh, uh, in terms of uh, what uh, the copyright amendment bill does, it seeks to introduce a definition also for for audiovisual work. Uh, so, if, if that is the case, uh, the the lack of an appropriate and clear distinction between between dramatic work and uh, Audiovisual work. What is your view in regard to that? Uh, are you of the view that uh, the that uh, dramatic work might be construed uh, to fall under audiovisual work, uh, uh, and whether it is uh, imperative to imperative to know that although all individual work may be dramatic work, but not all dramatic work is necessarily audiovisual work. I just wanted to check to check whether uh, is that is, 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 is that assertion correct? Uh, because uh, it's something that, 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 that I detected in your presentation. Uh, but also uh, the the uh, what is your view with regard to the uh, the uh, royalties and remuneration? Uh, do you support the fair remuneration objectives for complete work, or uh, you have a you have a, a, a different view? I'm looking particularly at uh, section six a seven a and eight a of the copyright act. Uh, what is your view in regard to that? Maybe just to get a sense as to whether uh, uh, did I capture your understanding correctly. Over to you, Christian. <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you, Chair. O on the first point, I, I have to say yes, you in fact understand us correctly on, on those points. Um, although um, audiovisual work can be dramatic work. Drama not all dramatic work is audiovisual work. So we are not against the, the um, definition of audiovisual work per se. We are just asking that um, dramatic work be defined in the bill as its own type of work. Currently, the bill tries to add it under literary work, which it isn't. So our proposal is to define dramatic work as its own type. Just add the def definition of dramatic work. And here again, um, I can refer you to our um, written, written where we actually for dramatic work. Because then, then literary work will be defined on its own, not to include dramatic work as it currently does in the bill. Um, dramatic work will be added a, a definition and then um, audiovisual work will have its own definition, where it's clear that these are distinct elements, distinct aspects. And again, yes, I do 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 agree that um, audiovisual works will include dramatic work, but not all dramatic work can be audiovisual work. It's it's two different concepts. And like I said in our presentation earlier, 
they are related. There's no question about it. But purely because they are related, they cannot be defined as one work or try and put under one definition. They still need to define as be defined separately. Um, I hope that answers that first question, Chair. And on the on the second um, question, again, without going into too much technicality, we do agree and we do applaud the fact that there will be fair remuneration addressed and there will be um, certain points there in CAB. Fair remuneration is essential. All we ask is that the members or that, that the creators, in our case the members of the Guild, has the opportunity to negotiate beyond that what is regarded as fair in terms of the law, that limitation. And that's why we said, and again, yeah, I can refer you to our, to our written submissions, we propose that all that's added I, before I say that, I do want to reiterate the fact that some of my co colleagues would have raised other concerns, which I agree needs to be addressed on the royalty, fair remuneration and royalty point. I, I, do, I do need to stress that, that just because we, we say at least, at least consider adding wording such as in the absence of an agreement to the contrary, the following will be regarded as fair, fair remuneration or something to that extent. Do not make it ultimate. And the reason I'm saying that, CAB does seek to protect creators. We all agree to that. However, it is trying to over-legislate on certain points. Again, yeah, I need, I need to stress, we're not talking about CAB as a whole. We're talking about specific concerns, one of which would be this and, and some of the others addressed. But if you try and over-legislate to protect, you are stifling the industry. You are, the industry will die. Legislation or over-legislation, and I think the easiest year is if I refer to an example. If you try and make a car so safe that nobody will ever get hurt, a car will stand still forever. It won't be used. And what's the use of that? We cannot over-legislate on specific points. We cannot over-restrict in the idea and with the goal to protect because we are stifling the industry like um, we, we addressed um, in, in our presentation, like us and a lot of the previous stakeholders addressed in their presentations as well as the written um, representations. And I think that that is what we I want to put through on on the remuneration. Yes, we applaud what has been done, but it has been done in a manner that is having the negative effect to what was intended. So re look at it. And again, yeah, I applaud um, government and parliament to to get input from genuine. Um, genuine specialist in copyright, like Prof Dean, um, like Nick Fro that, that um, spoke on behalf of Capasso, people that understand the legal implications of those specific industries, but also understand the technicality of copyright law and help, have them help redraft and reword and look at some of these concerns that a lot of stakeholders as, as, as mentioned. While still ensuring that the positive aspects like yes fair remuneration the concept of fair remuneration is positive but put it through in a practically um reasonable manner and uh, with that i would would close my answer on that thank you chief uh, thank, 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 thanks uh, uh, chris and uh, Lim, uh, for honoring our our appointment as uh, select committee and indeed, uh, uh, a sincere word of gratitude to, to you and the uh, for helping us uh, understand the angle from which the, uh, the writer's girl comes from. Uh, it will help us a lot as you continue to deliberate. And have a wonderful uh, evening now, I believe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, 
the next presenter will be uh, a Goodwill King Advertising, uh, led by Mr. Mbata. Uh, over to you, Mr. Mbata, if you're on the floor. Grace, my dear, do we have uh, Mr. Mbata on the floor? You see, is she? Okay. Uh, is the is the presentation uh, is the presenter from last week's session, I believe? Yes, she. All right. Let's see now. It looks like we have lost him. Just confirm that, uh, Madia. Um, sorry, we still there, Chair. We can see him, and um, we've also given him co-hosting rights, so he can project his own presentation. But he is oh. there. Okay. I think the challenge is we can't hear him, Jay. He's not muted, but we, we, I think there's a challenge with his audio. We can't hear him. Yes. In our apology, I think to him because last year, last week, it was the same uh, challenge. Yeah, we can't, we can't hear him. Can you just give him a call? We can hear you, Mr. Mbato. I guess you can hear us, but we can't hear you. Are you trying to get hold of him, Maria? Yes, she have advised him to <clears throat> remove his microphone from the computer and maybe just use the computer audio because I think there's a challenge with his headset. Yes. Or you can uh, let him uh, probably come back again by the help. Um, you see lost his info of the day she um but, uh, we just um we yeah yes let him start the reconnection maybe that might help Um, can you hear me now? Yes, Mr. Mbata, the floor is yours. Can you hear me clearly? Phew, finally. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to put my screen. I don't know if you can see my screen. Uh, no, we can't. Okay, let's try again. Oh, um, host has disabled attendee screen sharing. Okay. Can you help there, Maria? Yes, she <clears throat> um, I've made his other, I think he's, he's tried to log in on another device, um, but I've just, the, the device he just logged in on now, I've given co-hosting rights to that device. So it should show up now.
Can you see the screen? No, you have uh, see we have locked we have locked uh, in with two devices. Uh, no, it's the same thing. I'm gonna switch my screen on, but um, the presentation. Can you see me? Yeah, we can see you. Look, uh, what we can do? We can, we can, you can proceed. Uh, well, uh, I think maybe let's just try to. to yeah. To, yes. uh, can you drive my presentation for me then? Um, from yes. your side. Yes. 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 Okay. There you are. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so um, just as I've tried to explain last week that I'd rather use my real life case studies, um, but I'll be very quick. Um, and also highlight the fact that um, I'm an all round 360 from music to marketing uh, to advertising. So that then puts me in a very special position to understand uh, media, to understand digital, to understand live performances, to understand also the dramatic arts and to understand film and as well as animation. So you can move the screen. You can move the slides. Move the slide. Yes. Okay, so I just wanted to say, um, one of the areas that I picked up, I had I touched also your, your 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 copyright bill, that I would like to maybe just put it out there that maybe an IP tribunal as a holistic approach instead of just copyright uh, tribunal, and this is based on the fact that um, what you guys have done is is, is amazing. Uh, you, you you've made great efforts. Um, but the bigger challenge in the room is is before the copyright is created, is before the song is uh, released, or before the song is sent to the publisher. There's also battles that happen uh, in studio. There's battles that happen in the boardroom. There's battles that happen in the brainstorming session, which uh, the copyright law, as it is, does not necessarily protect. So an IP tribunal, a holistic approach, might be a better um, playground to work on for 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 the lawmakers. Can you move the screen? Can you move to the next slide, please? Okay, so um, I'd just like to start with the fact that advertising budgets in most of the case are from a client side, from multinational side, uh, which is both private sector and public sector. Um, so you move too fast for me now. <laughs> um, the, 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 those budgets pretty much control how audiovisual companies can, uh, operate. Can, can, my apologies, can you go back, uh, uh, Madia? Just one slide. Yeah. Yes. So in the in the in the copyright uh, bill, <laughs> okay, there we go. In the copyright uh, bill, um, I've noticed that starting at the bottom, in terms of the United States uh, reference, um, they 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 mentioned that they support the claim that the court cited political communications involving political contributions and expenditures. Now it was also concluded that the commercial speech, even communications such as advertising advertising, which merely suggests a business transaction is protected by First Amendment, right? So now, because I'm mostly in the music space, uh, but I've been in 360 advertising, I understand music is media and music is content, also at the same time music is culture. Now, IP theft is a big issue in our space, um, and that can refer to someone stealing the patent, the copyright, the trademark, but most importantly, the trade secrets, because that's where we suffer the most. Um, because most of these organizations don't want to get into formal contracts with us. Um, when you're an artist, when you're a creator, when you're a performer, an innovator, they treat you as just a brainless um, a chicken, you know, a headless chicken. They don't even want you in the boardroom. They don't want you in um, conversations that involve contracts and involves money. So, but yet, all your ideas and all your trade secrets in terms of business models have been discussed as if they, it was their own. So that is a big problem that I think needs to be addressed. So we can move one slide.
So the reason why I say IP tribunal is what I've noticed uh, is because the private sector budgets, you know, come from uh, the corporate sending out a brief and then different agencies go and pitch and the public sector operates the same way where they send out the tender and then we go and pitch. But between the, the, the brief and the actual uh, response to the brief, uh, our, our pitch ideas, our concepts and our strategies get presented to these managers and from there on they all disappear. And this happens both private sector and public sector, right? So why I say IP tribunal is because we can then break it into two where we have copyright. And then in this case is before it actually becomes an actual copyright, it first is a written text as a concept and it's a strategy. And that is what gets plagiarized. And then even before um, it becomes published or broadcasted, these are the designs that we use for to showcase what we would like to achieve. This is the audio demos that we show. This is the visual presentation that we show. This is the animation that we put together, you know, a little demo that we put together. This, that is what gets pleasurized. And once it gets pleasurized, they then remove us and they put other people on board and then all our work is gone. And then there's no agreement in place and then the law cannot even protect us. And then um, they, when you take it to even a small claims court, the small claims court will tell you, ah, oh, is there an agreement? If there's no agreement, we'll send you to high court. But then if you get to high court, High court is too expensive, first of all, and high court is 50-50, and chances are if you don't have an agreement in place, it's feelings that you are communicating there, it's not facts, and you are hurt, and you don't have money, you don't have budget, and the only thing you're dealing with is your emotions and your pain, uh, and you lose the case. And after you've lost the case, then you have to incur the cost. So a lot of people don't even bother taking these matters forward. And then in terms of the trademark, uh, there's a, another example that I'd like to take you through. We can move the slide. So what I was trying to explain here is that um, in the little diagram that I try to put together is it, it, the copyright does not just create itself. The audiovisual companies don't create the, 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 the copyright. Um, publishing companies don't create copyright. There's first the ideation phase, which is written text, whether it be a media copy or advertising copy. Then there's a the conceptual planning stage. Those are all labor hours and they require you to go to someone's house uh, breakfast, lunch, dinner, transportation, paying for parking, uh, work, electricity usage, internet usage, you know, technological devices being bought. Then there's the techno the caps conceptual phase where suddenly the idea just comes to life. And then that also requires a lot of design, a lot of planning. And then there's a strategic planning phase, which also requires a lot of writing, a lot of designing, and a lot of um, animation being prepared. And then there's the actual production phase. So most of the time, the, 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 the copyright law or the copyright looks at a producer as if the producer is a one size fits all. And that's where the mistakes usually happen. So that is the Three, the four stages that I'd like to put, you know, in place to say, can you add those stages as the pre-copyright creation stages to protect us as the thinkers? Because we are the people that are exploited the most, the thinker. Um, because even if I'm driving a car, I'm thinking, uh, and my thinking, my brain is working, but my labor is not compensated because you don't see it. Um, so due to plagiarism and IP infringement between the client and agency creator and producer or author or the artist, agreements are deliberately never finalized. But yet concepts that form the copyright will be published and broadcasted through third party parties, replacing the original authors, agencies, or independent strategists, creators, artists, and performers. So what I'm asking is can artists, creative, innovators, and performers please have a regulated legal framework which with the standardized procedures that are legally binding, enforced by government, and are compulsory for multinational clients to adhere to, and also for the following culprits who take all the money from us. These are the audiovisual companies. These are the public relations firms. These are the multinational advertising agencies. These are global digital marketing studios. These are producers and DJs who have now suddenly become artists, but yet they can't play an instrument. They cannot produce a melody. They cannot even sing. They cannot even perform. All they use is machine. So if machinery has replaced the artist, then artists might as well die because artificial intelligence has now come into uh, play. Um, you know, search engine optimization in terms of uh, searching for new ideas uh, and searching for keyword strategies or um, keyword approaches for creating is in place through Google. So that means whatever it is that we do and we share amongst each other will be plagiarized anyway before it gets published officially our work and our copyright. So publishers and production houses have now become a monopoly as a result. So move slide. 
So as I've mentioned, what the process, what they do, they, they, they ask for a presentation of our concepts and strategies, and then they remove the original author and the creator. They, 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 they plagiarize by replacing the original author and the strategist with their own in-house strategists to rework our documents. And then from there on, they send the brief written in their own words, taken from our original work to third party design agencies, third party audiovisual agencies, third party to recreate the work that we pitched. And then from there on, we have no control, we have no power, the copyright is gone. So the copyright as it stands, it only protects the copyright holder or the copyright owner, but they're not necessarily the original authors and creators. So what then happens is after the pitch process has taken place, we are say to the original authors about not having an agreement therefore they will not be credited for their work for their royalties and they will not be paid for their own creation of their own hours you know referring to the steps that i've explained about copyright doesn't create itself and then producers don't create the copyright producers just use the machine so if the machine is replacing the artist then why should we have the humans uh, that are creating we can move the slide so branded content marketing has now become the buzzword and been in for 24 years so due because of, of of technology because of social media and um apps that have been created so publishing impression companies advertising agencies public relations companies psychologically abuse and take over the lives of the artists creators innovators and performers intellectual and creative slaves you can move so a, little, a big problem a big elephant in the room is the intellectual dishonesty that is happening moonlighting as well as a conflict of interest. So what you would have is public sector and public sector managers themselves who earn a salary at a nine to five basis are moonlighting. They're running companies through their wives, they're running companies through their girlfriends, they're running companies through their sons, and they're running companies through their friends. And then they get profit shares from those agencies that are appointed through those company tenders. It happens on both sides, private sector and public sector. So what then happens, the public sector manager, public or uh, private sector manager, they have a direct interest in the work that is just a, that's, that's just been plagiarized. So this is how our IP and the copyright gets stolen, and then robbing us as independent artists, strategists, creators, innovators, and performers of our earnings. So what you'll then find is these private sector and public sector managers that have nine to five jobs are never audited. So they have high, like very, very flashy lifestyles, living in Dubai, you know, living in Paris with money that's supposed to have been paid to the artist. And they complain that investors will pull out if this copyright law has been passed into bill. No, investors will not pull out. Investors will work directly with the creators. Investors are not stupid. Investors have kids, have sons, they have children that are creators themselves. So I don't think investors are stupid. Investors are human beings too. Can we move the slides? So I'll just take, I just want to put a disclaimer that I'm just using this as an example um, uh, because these are my real life case studies. Uh, I am not naming and shaming, uh, but it's important that I put this out there. So apart from being a songwriter, singer, composer, and producer of music art forms, I'm also a marketer with over now 16, 17 years of media and, and advertising, and I've served South Africa's biggest brewing company with my creativity. So due to the above mentioned intellectual property rights issues being violated, I'm now questioning the registration of my work, which I produce for the global beer brand alongside award-winning artists such as Kuli Chan, Peach Black, Afro, Ishmael, and the band Murafe from Ghetto Rough, uh, which became a winning campaign in the advertising industry, the first of its kind to use hip hop music to build brands. Uh, again, no one knows where the song publishing details are, who the holder of the IP rights in this situation is, since it was an inter-agency collaboration. However, I paid 30,000 Rand for the recording and the song was used. And right now I don't have control over the song. When I asked DJ Cleo about the song, DJ Cleo didn't even know that I paid for the song. When I asked Ishmael about the song, he didn't even know that I paid for the song. As soon as they found out, then they realized that somebody who paid for studio time or paid, they're supposed to be the rights owner. So I had multiple phone calls, but no one is saying anything about the IP rights and the royalties for the campaign song. Next slide, please. So again, um, the first of its kind that has ever done for a branded brand, where nobody knew Zix, who Zix Pantuni was. Zix Pantuni's very first album in 2009, multinational wine and spirits company based in Stellenbosch and Santon sent me a creative brief to develop communication strategy to bring their brand positioning to life with an African within the African consumer groups. After eight months of working very hard on a campaign from research, insight, strategy, and concept development to execution and trade all by myself around the 10th Metro FM Music Awards. The campaign became a winner, which resulted in Zix Bantuini launching his very first album and winning his very first music award. Now, I was the first digital agency for that brand. 
through and the through the line agency for the brand created their first mobile site which today we know is apps then we didn't have apps we had mobile sites and then the social media pages they didn't even have that so however immediately after the successful case study the senior managers took all my branding collateral refused to pay for the brand campaign and illegally transferred my ip rights to a non-african agency to roll out my ip copyright and trademark to the news cafe group nationally so i lost 900,000 rand now i'm an entrepreneur I started out i use most of my savings 900,000 rand gone down the drain they do not pay me for my intellectual property no compensate me for my operating costs copyright usage and project management scope creep now then the campaign was plagiarized by the very same record label because now no one has ownership of the copyright or ip rights and then implemented through a competing brand company and ran it for 10 years Next slide, please. So as I've mentioned, so there's three stages. I'm not going to read the, the, the story again. So there's three areas here. There's the IP. First of all, we try to use non-disclosure agreement. They, nobody wants to sign our non-disclosure agreement. And it's across the board. And then they want us to come and talk. After we finish talking, somebody will read us and then our insights our passion our energy gets absorbed from there on our they ask us to send our ideas and concept on email and then sometimes we talk on whatsapp sometimes we talk on uh, you know uh, on, on social media inboxes and personal engagement but from there on with no proper uh, contract sent to us the, our project is plagiarized and then project is implemented through a third party and then they refuse to pay for our labor and they refuse to pay us so a refusal to credit us or even pay the royalties for usage next slide please so I then realized that this is organized IP theft because it's happening across the board. And what, what, what breaks my heart more than anything else is that these are highly educated people. These are people with master's degrees that are doing this. These are people with doctorates that are doing this. And they do it knowing very well that there's no way you're going to challenge them in court. They do it very well that you don't have enough budget to take them on. And if you do win, they were going to continue uh, to appeal until you suffocate. So I want to put a disclaimer that all these case studies are my real projects that have been plagiarized and IP stolen. Individual names and company names and brand names and images are just for presentation purposes only. I don't mean to attack anyone, but it's something that has caused trauma, has a serious loss in my company, my identity, and heck, extremely humiliated. Next slide, please. So I then decided, that let me start an African Creative Incubator. Now, with this African Creative Incubator is to collaborate with local and global brands that invest in African communities with research and insights, creative strategy development, and implementation of 360 brand communication plans that truly engage the consumers with an authentic African voice. Now, the processes that I would follow is research, is strategies, it's conceptualization, evaluation, and implementation. So this is what is missing from the copyright uh, bill, all the stages that we go through before the work gets developed. So I launched this with students at Vert, um, and uh, I also started the Graduate Ambassador Program as a platform to keep women and youth engaged in these issues. Um, next slide, please. So the, the Graduate Ambassador Program, basically I work with uh, first year students or those who have just matriculated and struggling to get some uh, opportunities and I just work with them for free, but I realize that it just becomes very expensive and just unbearable. And then stage two is those that have just graduated and don't have any work experience. And then I get them involved. As soon as I get a client, we get them involved. We all work with whatever little change and leftovers we have. Next slide, please. So with this uh, ideation, strategy, and concept development, I then plan to build the Center of Creativity in Davidson. So a township creative incubator to empower African creativity and play my part in terms of diversity and transformation media and advertising by focusing on music, film, graphic, as well as industrial design and digital arts. So I took, I, I took over my late father's house uh, and then I decided that I will name it the Libre Matosa Foundation and also house what I call the Libre Matosa Academy. And I went to the family to speak to them and they loved the idea. Next slide. So City Press uh, got hold of the idea. They loved it too. And then uh, they researched for about five months to find out if I'm telling the truth. And they found out that I'm telling the truth. They published the story. It's ACBC Morning Live also researched did my background checks, found out I'm telling the truth. And then we published the story. Hard Rock Cafe, which is a global brand, came on board and supported me. Uh, Taj Meg, which is also a New York brand, came on board and supported me. Next slide. So this is where now the problem started. As soon as the idea started picking up, the idea was plagiarized, the concept and strategy was then registered behind my back through CIPC. And this is after months of working, also the people refusing to sign an non-disclosure agreement. Then all my trade secrets, which were submitted, 
in written form and printed on emails as proof and ask, can you please sign each document of the work that I've presented to you guys so that tomorrow you don't say that I didn't do this. That was not done. But instead, um, the, 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 the family went behind my back, registered it, and then took over the IP. When asked what you were doing this it's our brand because we paid for it see that's where the problem was and then i went to a cipc about this matter it says what do you mean how can somebody just steal something that you've worked on for eight months and then they say i just paid for it so if i can just pay for anything that means it doesn't matter if i create or not somebody can just come and pay for it so that's where the issue is when people are telling us about investors investors we're going to pull out pull out from who Pull out from who? Pull out from the people that create or pull out from the people that steal the creation? So we need to be very clear about pleasing investors when investors don't know the truth. Investors need to know who's the actual person that spends hours and days and nights developing the work. Investors are not stupid. And then from there on, um, I presented the work uh, with a plan to go to DTI. And then they went to DTI behind my back and they got DTI to fund them. And as soon as it was funded, they created the, the copyright, which is the documentary, which was aired on a Viacom platform called BET. Uh, and then for three years of going back and forth and not getting anywhere, 23rd of October, during the Piano Music Awards, I meet with the SABC team and I tell them about the story because at least they did the background search and they know the truth. But the manager at the point in time says, we'll help and see if we can bridge this gap because we don't want to go to court. We don't want to go to the media about this. We'd rather solve it amongst ourselves. So, and then he then stopped talking to me and then the work was commissioned to SABC One and then they just disappeared. So next slide. So this was obviously at the launch and the pictures that were taken of the launch as proof. Next slide. This was actually my first presentation like four years before the documentary was even published just to show that this work was already done, was already completed. The only th and I, I went as far as going to NUMSA, uh, NUMSA to try help because uh, the family wanted to build a uh, tombstone because it was just falling apart. And I went to NUMSA since they've got uh, dove uh, funerals to say, can you guys help us so that we could rebuild uh, uh, uh tombstone? And I, I, I did everything right. And they just took the whole IP and disappeared. Next slide, please. And then uh, on the day of the Piano Music Awards, I, I spoke to the SABC team and also spoke to one of the members of the Department of Arts and Culture to say, can we talk about these matters amongst ourselves? Um, and that is, uh, can we do the Ama Piano Music Conference? Now you'd notice that I wrote Ma Piano. I didn't write Ama Piano. The reason for that is that sometimes when you're going to honor a culture, when you're going to honor a, a, a community, you need to be true to the creators of the sound. You need to be true to the creators of the music. And that is the Tsuana people who, and, and they don't say Ama Piano. Piano. So now people say, Kima Piano. So now to take and say, I'm a piano, you're moving it away from its people, you're moving it away from its culture, you're putting it around the Nguni culture. So now the whole tribe, the whole community of the Tsana, of the Sutu people, mostly Tsana in this case, who, who started the sound, Kima Piano. Kima Piano. So that's why I put it like this. So next slide. So, and then I said, let's talk about this. But and now, because I know what happens, so I decided that as soon as I come up with a concept, I'm going to publish it on social media so that the public know who was the first person to, to suggest this idea as I pitch, in the, you know, with the different multinationals. As you can notice here, I reached out to the artists from Galawa Jasmine, uh, who were behind the legacy of Lebomatosa from Ed Cook and then... Uh, um, the Small, who's big with the Mapiano sound, and I asked, can we do a Mapiano music conference and deal with these matters amongst ourselves, because this is a serious problem. So these are the creatives that I've done. And then next slide. And then at the same time, like I said, let's do it around March, 25 March, which is Tembisieta's birthday. And then the same creators of the Mapiano Music Awards, they then duplicated the idea, do their own Mapiano music conference on the 22nd. You see, you see what happens. Pre the creation of the copyright, they already, you know, go in first before you. So next slide, please. So, and the, when I researched about the Mapiano Awards, I realized that the guys that are used to doing this, they just take people's concepts and they'll go re-register them as their own. And though this is a culture that happens before the copyright is created. So now you're competing with the people that are, are supposed to be part of your team, the people that are supposed to be benefiting the community and they're part of your industry too. So that's where the big problem is. And then when you talk about funders, which funders? Because these funders know the truth. Next slide, please. 
And then um, comes to the concept of uh, building local culture and building local sound, local media. And then the marketing strategy for how do we then build excitement around this culture. I then present it to the, the ACBC marketing guy to say, let's do a local hip hop versus Amapiano as a, as, a, as a digital activation strategy that will drive excitement as a build up to us the awards. Next slide. What happens then, as I've said earlier on, um, from the 23rd, the strategy was proposed, and then in December, I followed up with multiple requests for presentation to consolidate the brand ideas into one campaign, suggested a brand campaign using local hip-hop and I'm a piano as a roadshow towards the upcoming music awards, which took place in Johannesburg. The ACBC One team loved their strategy and asked for a meeting as a follow-up in January, but the January meeting never happened. Nevertheless, I emailed the document so that this is what I'd like us to talk about. And the local Amabi versus Amabiano strategy was implemented through their in-house marketing teams. And then the third-party agencies was used to roll it out and trade. And me as the author and the strategist that was then excluded with my team, the campaign has now contributed to their digital marketing ROI 1 billion, the biggest that they've ever heard as ACBC One. They've never heard of, of such, but it happened. And how did they get that? I first presented it to them and I followed up for more than five months to say this is the way to go. Next slide, please. So this is the creative that I've showed them to show that so that if anything happens, they must know that I presented this thing so that they can know that wh what they are doing is not right. So you can see that there's also the Mapiano Music Conference, uh, as well as the local hip hop versus the Mapiano uh, brand activation pillar, which is music. Next slide. And then now, when I started going back, I realized that the same manager did the same thing when I developed a strategy for the Pen South African Language Board. I developed a strategy called Free Your Language, right? S same slide. Next slide, sorry. <laughs> So as you can see here, uh, just to start all over again, the Copyright Act is supposed to protect written text, including advertising copy. But now what happened is that the brand manager called me to ask if he can use my campaign strategy uh, called the hashtag free your language uh, as a strategy for ACBC awards for himself because we had done this. I agreed, I, exci I was excited to say, wow, I, my work is, for, is going to be honored by ACBC radio and ACBC television because now it's putting the brand ACBC as a whole Forward. However, I never, I never heard from the guys again. And there was no contracts between me, SBC, and Pensalp. So then I saw my work being posted uh, as the work of the broadcaster. So they flipped it upside down. So next slide. Yeah, um, so, so I just want to also say that the entire creative and communication process that the marketing department carries out and that brings added value to the client or even the company comes under influence of intellectual property as a whole, not just copyright. So this type of influence has a concrete effect on the protection of these intangible assets that we don't see and touch and feel. Next slide. So music is media. So um, next slide. So why then this became a big issue for me is because then I had to go back. I saw Mr. Vusilio is here and uh, I've asked him for help as well because uh, he knows my true story. He knows my life for the past 24 years. <clears throat> now, SABC won Jam Ali Talent Search Competition. I was the original author for the lyrics and the melodies composed in the album. Background vocals were my friends and some of the singers from Joya Celebration, but the whole musicality was directed by me. The instrumental uh, was done by Sikhlo Gunene, but I first composed it, but he was my piano teacher uh, at school. And then Peter Ngobese was the producer assigned by the record company. I didn't know him until the, the recording. The album was nominated for the first finalist SNB, uh, f &B Awards. However, before Vusiliu became part of the, uh, of the company, the PR officer instructed me to write King P publishing on my album sleeve, but yet the publisher was meant to be EMI or CCP records. No publishing has ever been received for 24 years. The contract was terminated uh, without the five-year agreement being honored. My masters were never returned back to me, but the music was on high rotation on SABC TV and SABC radio. Um, and then uh, after I was released, I became part of Prime Media where Vusi was. And then on my own though, Without Prime Media, I wrote and produced a second album as an artist, composer, producer uh, on my own. Friends offered me a free studio for demo recording. However, unfortunately, during December holidays, the friends disappeared. Um, and after the friends disappeared, uh, my music was then later released uh, six years later, and it won Best Gospel Award for the Crown Gospel Music Awards. You know, uh, my music is gone, but yet it's, it's winning awards. So next slide.
so this was the original sleeve. We can, um, I've just explained everything. Next slide. So this is the album that uh, won Best Gospel Award. This is a colleague of mine I met at church, you know. I, I also went to the same music school with him, but uh, the music was mine and I've got uh, proof from the other students at the music school. Next slide. Next slide. So I just want to get into the sound recording and collecting societies as well, because we, the more I looked at it, the more I realized that it's not a very realistic uh, in terms of uh, giving a clear picture to the lawmakers as well as, uh, oh my word, <laughs> to the lawmakers um, and everyone involved in the business value chain. Phase one, most of the time in the music creation phase, is the conceptual song creator, you know, that the melody composer sometimes will be the beat maker, sometimes the lyrical contributor and the melody player, because not every melody creator is, can, can play. From there on, uh, the composition gets done with the, uh, the merger between melody lyrics and the structure of the song gets done. And then the beat composer uh, comes on board. Sometimes the beat composer will be first vice versa. And then the instrumental and the melody and the lyrics gets blended. From there, when the melody, lyrics and the beat has been integrated, then the, there's a pre-production mix. And then the post-production mix, most of the time, this is a sound engineer job. But once that stuff is done, the person who holds the computer and the person who owns the studio will reg register himself as a producer, even though his role in the creative value chain was a sound engineer. But, and that's the only thing that we require from him. Then, and that person will say, I'm the producer of the song. And then because the, the, the open files and the stems, uh, you know, and the separates are sitting in the computer, he then will use that in court and will use it everywhere to say, it's my song, I'm the producer, I'm gone. Now, I would like to then to propose that we use an advertising legal framework to how the collecting societies work, which is also the creation, all song creation process must be supported by timesheets for conceptual thinkers, composers, lyricists, and instrumentalists, mixing engineers, and mastering engineers. Because the word producer is very confusing. It makes one think that there's a kingmaker out there, but there's no such a thing. The song creation is a, is, 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 it's a process. So, and the biggest culprits here, people call themselves DJs too, that they must also clearly highlight what their actual role is in the song creation process, supported by these timesheets. How much time per hour, per minute did they spend creating? And what was the actual role in the creation? So now this comes also to these concept of compilation albums that have been recreated by live musicians. They also must go back to their original authors and creators and have approval in writing with proven timesheets as to how much time I spent in this process and what is the cost breakdown during this process um, prior to the work being transferred to, uh, to publishers and production houses. Next slide, please. Okay, so the, the next slide is just about myself, which I don't want to get into. So I think the, all the, the stuff is done. Uh, thank, thank, thanks, Mr. Mbacha, for the, uh, for the case study that you have uh, uh, given to us uh, to be able to locate the, the uh, two bills and the, uh, the gaps that you have uh, lighted. Uh, and the uh, suggestions that you have made informed by, by where you come from. Uh, yes, sir. It's, 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 a, it's a real case study, uh, real life, and uh, uh, what you have gone through, and uh, the caps that are there in the, in the, in the, in the intellectual uh, property regime. Uh, your suggestions are quite categorical and very clear in terms of where do we need to start? Uh, before before the actual before the actual copyright uh, and the uh, suggestion also to say uh, instead of calling copyright let's 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 uh, let's let's call it uh, the, 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 the the intellectual the yeah the, the, the intellectual property tribunal uh, which from your side it is uh, quite uh, broad and quite inclusive and not selective uh, so that it must not leave anyone out and uh, Correct. We are, we have really, we have really understood you. Just let me just check from uh, members. Any uh, point that members would want to to can, come can, I, can I can I also make one suggestion which I I left out there? Yes. Um, and that is, I've, I've spoken to obviously UJ Law Clinic. I've spoken to Vets Law Clinic 
um, spoken to uh, legal aid to see how we can salvage the situation. Um, that's the reason why I created what I call the Creative Legal Clinic. Okay, so I founded it in 2017, um, and I asked the professor of IP adverts to say, okay, while we're still sorting out this matters, because all the lawyers don't know what they're talking about, most of them, um, and uh, can we then use the law clinic adverts or at UJ maybe once a uh, once a week or maybe for now once a month where just creatives can consult uh, with an IP specialist because we don't have a lot of them. There's very few copyright specialists. There's very few IP specialists. Then once a month, an IP specialist will be available at UJ Law Clinic or Adverse Law Clinic where all artists can bring their cases and then they can then document them. They could help you um, as the lawmakers to see exactly what's happening. And you'll notice all the cases start with the very same friends. It's, a, it's the inner circle that will first plagiarize the work. And then the copyright gets uh, infringed upon. So, and then from there on, the publishing companies get involved. So before you blame the record companies, before you blame the broadcasters, you'll notice that your own friends, your own colleagues, are <laughs> to be blamed first. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bata. <laughs> thank That's you. Great. Uh, members, uh, I think we have uh, reached the, the end uh, of uh, today's uh, uh, public hearing. We have exhausted all the all the speakers uh, that were that were meant to be to 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 be uh, attended to. Uh, maybe just from my dear, uh, the way forward. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, we are concluding our public hearings next week, um, Tuesday, the fourteenth of March, she with um, the remainder of our um, stakeholders. Right. Uh, the session is again from 10 until 5, and the committee is again received permission to sit the whole day and be excused from plenary. Okay, then uh, on that note, uh, honorable members, uh, let me then take this opportunity to, to indeed express a word of gratitude to your attendance. It was a long day, but uh, it's a necessary, it's a necessary protracted uh, uh, day so that you are able to get a sense in terms of uh, uh, what our uh, critical stakeholders are, are saying in relation to this bill. It is quite critical because uh, you remember that uh, uh, initially it was, it, 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 it was meant to be, to be section 75, but after the, the views that were expressed by the president and sending it back, one of the issues that were raised was how it was checked. So your attendance and your, your presence today and your contribution uh, is, quite, is, quite, is, quite, is, is quite important. It must be appreciated. So let's adjourn this meeting until uh, uh, next week, uh, Tuesday. Thank you, honorable members. The meeting stands adjourned.